governing remote meetings with some council members participating remotely. The requirements of notice, access, and minutes are met as required by law. And the public and the media are able to view this meeting on the government channel, the city's Facebook page, and, or on the city's YouTube page. Uh, first, we're going to go ahead and have introductions. So please introduce yourselves by the order provided to you before the meeting. Uh, I will say that Mayor Lyles is away today, so she will not be here. I'm running the meeting remotely, although I will be having to sign off after decisions, and Councilmember Braxton Winston will take over after that. So I am Julie Eisel, Mayor Pro Tem, serving at large. Want to go with those in the room first, Council Members? Greg Phipps at large. Braxton Winston at large. That's all we have for our council members in the room tonight. So everybody else is virtual. Okay, let's go ahead with, uh, uh, did you introduce yourself, Ms. Winston? Um, Braxton Winston at large. Okay, how about virtually? Dimple Ashmara at large. Anyone else? Larkin Eggleston, District 1. <laughs> Malcolm Graham, District 2. Victoria Watlington, District 3. Renee Johnson, District 4. Tark Bakari, District 6. Good evening, Ed Driggs, District 7. Thank you. Let's go ahead with staff who are present this evening. Stephanie Kelly, City Clerk. Jake Carpenter, CDOT. Dave Petten, Resuming Manager. Brandon Brazil, CDOT. Terry Hagler Gray, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Donata Jackson, Office of Constituent Services. How about online? Allison Craig, Interim Planning Director. Okay, so looks like that might be it. Okay, and then I want to introduce um, Kiba Samuels, our, the chair of our zoning committee. Hello, Kiba Samuel, chair of the zoning committee for Charlotte Mecklenburg. Um, do I say my spiel now? Yes, go ahead, okay, Kiba. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, members of public. My name is Kiba Samuel. I serve as chair of the zoning committee. The zoning committee will meet on Tuesday. has changed. May 3rd. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Tuesday, May 3rd at 5.30 p.m. to deliberate and make uh, recommendations on the petitions being heard tonight. That May 3rd meeting will not be a continuation of tonight's public hearing. There will be no opportunity for public input unless and until a member of the committee has a question that is best addressed by a member of the public. That meeting will stream online via the City of Charlotte Planning, Design, and Development's Facebook or YouTube page. Um, joining us via live stream on the government channel or the City of Charlotte's YouTube channel are my fellow zoning committee members, Commissioners Andrew Blumenthal, Astrid Gerinos, John Hamm, Courtney Rhodes, Sam Spencer, and Douglas Walton. Again, I'm Kiba Samuel, Chair of the Zoning Committee, and I will be with you for the entirety of the evening. Should you have any questions? Thank you, Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Ms. Samuel. Um, <clears throat> next, we'll have our invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Our invocation is something that we begin our meetings with, and they're, they're uh, either messages of inspiration um, followed by the, uh, the, excuse me, they are generally messages of inspiration that um, are expressed by individual council members and it helps us to get the meeting started off to the right foot, um, and it's intended to solemnize our proceedings. We celebrate the religious diversity of our committee, community, including those without a religious faith tonight. So this evening, uh, Council Member Phipps will begin with our invocation, and then I'd like you to uh, all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, if possible. <coughs> Mr. Phipps? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I so <clears throat> uh, to, this evening, I would like to... Um, 
commemorate, I guess, the 54th uh, anniversary of the untimely death of Dr. Martin Luther King. As we all know, he was assassinated 54 years ago in Memphis, Tennessee. And I would like to read a portion of a sermon that he delivered from the pulpit of Ebenezer Baptist Church on February the 4th, which was two months exactly before his uh, assassination. And the title of his sermon at that time was uh, The Drum Major Instinct. So I read tonight, uh, quoting directly from Dr. King, and it reads as follows. <clears throat> Every now and then, I guess we all think realistically about the day when we will be victimized with what is life's final common denominator. That's something that we call death. We all think about it. And every now and then I think about my own death and I think about my own funeral. And I don't think of it in a morbid sense. And every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I would want said? And, leave the word, and I leave the word to you this morning. If, you, if any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the unity, eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. And every now and then I wonder what I would want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to close those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. Yes, I was a drum major for righteousness. And all the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can, spend the message, if I can spread the message as the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Mm -hmm. Dr. King went on further to say, yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right or on your left side, not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right side or your left side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition, but I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment to others so that we can make of this world a world, a new world. And that was delivered uh, on uh, Sunday morning, February the 4th, from the pulpit of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phipps. Wonderful words that we, our world would be a better place if we all lived by that. Thank you. Uh, could you all please stand, if possible, for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'd like to acknowledge that council member Matt Newton has joined us. If you want to introduce yourself, Mr. Newton. Uh, good evening, everyone. Matt Newton, District 5. Great to be with you. Thank you. So tonight, um, I'm going to start with an explanation of our zoning process. Our process begins with applications that are submitted to the planning staff for review. There are cases that are- Pro Pro Tem? Yes. Could I just say something briefly? Is that I'm to your report. Yeah, I, yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to point out we all received a notice today that today is National Line Worker Appreciation Day, and I thought that shouldn't go completely unheeded by us. Uh, 
Our line crews are true first responders who serve customers 24-7 to ensure they have the energy needed to power their lives. We should all appreciate the dedication these critical colleagues have in all types of weather, missing events with their families and putting lives in potentially harmful situations. And I have visited a couple of the locations where they do their work and have always been impressed by their commitment uh, and by their willingness to go out on a freezing cold night and handle high tension lines. So uh, I hope you'll join me in expressing our appreciation to our line workers. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Driggs, for highlighting the important work of our, our line workers. Appreciate it. Um, tonight in our, our zoning meeting, we have two different types of cases on the agenda, our decisions and our hearings. Our decisions are cases for which a public hearing has previously been held and there is no further public comment. Our hearings, in our hearings, anyone wishing to speak is asked to see the clerk before the start of the hearing. Uh, and then staff gives a presentation which does not have a time limit. Following staff's presentation, the petitioner and those in favor of the hearing get three minutes combined to present their case. Unless there are opponents signed up to speak, or if staff is in opposition, uh, the petitioner then gets 10 minutes to present. The opponents also get 10 minutes combined, and the petitioner will then get a two-minute rebuttal. If no one is opposed or signed up uh, to speak, staff will go ahead with their short presentation, and then the public hearing is closed, and the next public hearing is opened. The petition then goes to the Zoning Committee of Planning Commission for review and recommendations. And I will note that if the hearings go long, we do have a tradition of recessing at 10 p.m. in fairness to all of those who um, have, have been waiting for their hearings and, and sometimes we don't make our attention span uh, gets a little bit weak after 10 p.m. So we do recess and um, I think at that point, Mr. Winston will give a heads up around nine o'clock if it looks like we're not gonna be able to finish. So tonight we do have um, some items that have been deferred and no withdrawals, just deferrals. So we'll go ahead and I'll read those and then I would entertain a motion to defer those until it looks like all of them would go to the May 23rd, 2022 uh, zoning hearing. The first one is item number two, 2021-133, the Drakeford Com Communities, um, approximately 6.57 acres located south of Allegheny Street, west of Rash Ashley Road in Council District 3. Item number three, 2021-139, Boulevard at 18th Central uh, LLC, which is approximately 0.33 acres located on the east side of East 34th, northwest of the plaza. And that's in Mr. Eggleston's district, District 1. I'm just going to read the districts. Item number 4, 2021-141 by the Drakeford Companies, and that's in District 1, Mr. Eggleston's district. Item number 5, <clears throat> excuse me, 2021-188, Dominion Realty Partners, that's in District 3, Ms. Watlington's district. Item number 6, 2021-197, Crescent Communities, and that is in District 1, Mr. Eggleston's district. Item number 7, 2021-199, Nest Home Communities, that is also in Council District 1, Mr. Eggleston. May Move I have a per those, uh, all of those uh, decisions and, and that hearing? Second. Thank you. Um, we'll go through roll call. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Emma, yes. Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Okay, thank you. For the following items, there have been changes after the uh, zoning committee vote and I will. Uh, yeah, we, we can take those when they come up on yeah, each item. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take those when we come up to them. So that leaves us with the first hearing items. Again, two, three, four, five, six, and seven have been deferred. So we'll go ahead and start with item number eight.
And this is rezoning petition 2021-056 by Urban Trends Real Estate Inc. Approximately 1.35 acres located along the north side of B Avenue, east of Beatty Ford Road and north of Interstate 85. And that's in District 2, Mr. Graham's district. The current zoning is R3 single family residential, R17 multifamily residential, and the proposed zoning is UR2 urban residential and conditional. The zoning committee voted 6-0 to recommend approval of this petition, and staff also recommends approval of the petition. May I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Thank you. Um, we'll go through roll call. Uh, Mr. Winston? Yes. Madam, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, can we make sure that that includes the uh, um, adoption of the consistency statement? I'm sorry. Um, yes, I don't. It does. I have that script. Um, Second that. Okay, one moment. Let me. I guess I need to read it into the record. Um, may okay. The motion is to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition. We have a motion to approve that and a second. Um, so. If we can go, we'll call Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Ms. Ejmira. Yes. And Mr. Phipps. Yes. Thank you. The next item, item number nine, is 2021-103 by Providence Group Capital LLC, approximately 2.25 acres, um, located on the north side of Blair Hill Road, south of Clanton Road, and west of South Tryon Street. That's Council District 3, Miss Watlington's district, currently zoned I-1 Light Industrial, and the proposed zoning is TOD UC, Transit Oriented Development Urban Center Conditional, the Zoning Committee voted 7-0 to recommend approval of this petition, and the staff recommends um, approval of the petition. May I have a, a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agenda and the screen, and as the Council's own, and approve or deny the petition? Motion to adopt and approve. Second. Thank you. Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Uh, Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Emma, yes. Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. Next item is item number 10. Petition 2021-142 by PDC Land Acquisition, LLC, approximately 36.23 acres located north of Old Moores Chapel Road, south of Mount Holly Road, and east of I-485. That's in the ETJ, uh, and that's closest to uh, Board of County Commission uh, District 2, Miss Leakes District, and the closest City Council District is District 3, Council Member Watlington's district. It's currently zoned mixed use 2 and R4 single family residential. The proposed zoning is R12 multifamily conditional residential and NS neighborhood services. The zoning committee recommended 7 to 0 to approve, recommend approval of this petition, and staff recommends approval of this petition. May I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency? as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition motion to adopt and approve second thank you uh mr winston yes yes mr bakari yes mr driggs yes mr eggleston yes mr graham yes miss johnson yes mr newton yes uh miss watlington yes I'm a yes, Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Okay, thank you. The next item is item number 11. 
Petition number 2021-150 by Tribute Companies, Inc., approximately 37.14 acres, located on the southeast side of North Tryon Street, east of Interstate 485, and north of University City Boulevard. That's in the ETJ and Board of County Commission District 3, Mr. Dunlap's district, and it's closest to City Council District uh, 4, Ms. Johnson's district. It's currently zoned R3, single-family residential, and the proposed zoning is R12, multifamily conditional. And the zoning committee has a recommendation of 7 to 0 to approve this petition, and the staff recommends approval of this petition. May I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition? Motion to approve. Motion to adopt and approve. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Second, and yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Uh, Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Uh, yes, and I wanted to just add one thing for discussion. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to, uh, to thank the developer for working with the, the neighborhood, um, this, this uh, proposal or the petition includes dedication of land for a new park, um, improvement of the infrastructure, and building a new public street network. So these are the type of uh, concessions and standards that we like to see in, um, in our petitions, as, uh, specifically in D District 4 that I can speak to. So I just really want to thank the developer uh, for bringing um, this type of petition to the table. So in my and I do support, so yes. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Next item is item number 12. It does have some changes. It's item number 2021-151 by Lincoln Harris. Approximately 3.65 acres located on the south side of Fairview Road and the east side of Cameron Valley Parkway, west of Colony Road, in Council District 6, Mr. Bakari's district. It's currently zoned MUD O, which is mixed use development, optional. The proposed zoning is MUD O SPA, which is mixed use development, optional site plan amendment. The zoning committee voted seven to zero to recommend approval of this petition and staff recommends approval of this petition. Uh, since the uh, zoning committee met, there have been some changes um, bear with me one second. Yep. Um, the petition proposes to allow the re redevelopment of the existing movie theater with up to 250 square feet of office uses and up to 20,000 square feet of commercial uses subject to conversion rights for the site located in the Phillips Place Shopping Center in South Park area. The following changes were made after the Zoning Committee's recommendation. They addressed outstanding issues from Zoning Committee, 65 MAC feet maximum height for the parking deck. Optional request for height only applies to building envelope. Uh, added renderings and site cross section to illustrate building height. Extension of loop along Allen Tate frontage. In the alternative, it commits to $100,000 contribution to the loop if the extension can't be made along Allen Tate's frontage that the petitioner does not control. It commits to timing for installing the loop within 12 months of, per, of building permit, and the petitioner shall contribute $100,000 to the city of Charlotte to be used towards loop improvements within eight months of the approval of the rezoning if a building permit has not been issued or such issuance is reasonably imminent for development on the property at that time. Staff recommends uh, they believe that the changes are minor and address staff and community concerns and does not warrant additional review by the zoning committee. So I have a motion to not to send back. Second. Second. Okay. So to not send um, this case back to the zoning committee, uh, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ejmira? 
Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and now I need a motion to adopt the zoning committee statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and on the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition. We have to adopt and approve. Thank you. Second. Comment, please. Yes, Mr. Mr. Bakari. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bertin. Um, I just want to say that um, the, the last month has been very busy um, working with the neighborhood, working with the petitioner, um, working on something that's obviously, as we discussed last time, very, very important to our community and also complicated. And, and I'd just like to say a big thank you to the petitioner and to the neighborhood on both sides. You guys um, are a case study in working in good faith um, for the betterment of, of the broader community while working to address your issues. So as you've seen what, by what the changes were, even since the zoning committee has met in the last couple of weeks, um, uh, there has been a lot of concessions made and working in good faith. And just to recap again, just so folks remember, while it is high and, and there is some, um, some material height to it, it is 10 stories, not 20. Again, want to make sure people understand that there is some elements of design in this with taller floors, taller, um, taller ceilings. Um, you heard the usable areas of the building do not extend above 200 feet. That additional height is to accommodate architectural elements. And then you also heard the mayor pro tem say that 65 feet um, is the max height for the parking deck area. This is something that was clarified um, and that additional optional request only applies to that building envelope. Um, you also heard about some of the Allen Tate frontage and the committing of $100,000 if the loop can't be made along that frontage. I got clarity on exactly what that is. And again, it shows that um, the petitioner is making substantial contributions in the form of community benefits to the loop, which is very important to, this, to, this, to the neighborhood, to the SPAN organization, and to the broader business community there. And they're putting their money where their mouth is in relation to uh, um, preparing for and anticipating issues that arise. And, and that, I think, brings me to that last piece of um, the timeline was one of the things that we really wanted to make sure this wasn't something that was many years in the future, potentially, for the community benefit of the loop. Um, the, the commitment was made by the petitioner to install this within 12 months of a building permit, which is very unique in a situation like this, and an aggressive timeline to put a material investment in, into, into play, into the works, as well as today, a final piece of contributing $100,000 to the loop, as you just heard, if they don't have a building permit granted within six months of the expiration of the zoning appeal period. So. Um, to recap, you know, this is difficult. It was difficult for community members to look at the height of this, but it was also important for all of us who spent the better part of two years debating intensely the need for height and density on how do we, how do we enable a situation where this stuff can happen, but we don't just forget about and brush over the neighbor's concerns. And I think we've done just that. We've, we've, we've positioned this where do the neighbors love the height? Still don't love it, but they are, they are very much um, in agreement in, in the conversations I've had that these community benefits and concessions that have been made since we all last met a month ago are very much appreciated. So I say thank you to all those folks um, that were involved. Thank you, Mr. Bakari. So I have a, a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Wallington? Yes. I am a no. Uh, Ms. Hejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> item number 13 is petition number 2021-186 by Kinger Homes, approximately 2.84 acres at the intersection of Mallard Creek Road and Governor Hunt Road, west of David Taylor Drive. That's Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's district. The current zoning is R3, single family residential. The proposed zoning is R8, multifamily residential conditional. The zoning committee voted six to zero to, to recommend approval of this petition. 
and staff also recommends approval of this petition. May I have a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council zone and approve or deny the petition? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any comments? Uh, yes, I have a comment, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh -huh. This is another one where I really want to thank the petitioner for listening to the community. Um, you may recall last month we had neighborhood opposition. Um, uh, Ms. Kathy Clarkson spoke and um, I was able to meet with her and the developer after the zoning meeting, also with our CDOT team, Brandon. He was, um, he was a leader and he was very, very helpful in working with NCDOT to get the approval. We were able to get the, um, the position of the, the street light and those changes made and um, the neighbors were really listened to and the petitioner worked closely and listened. So this is a win-win situation and I'm happy and excited to support this petition. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Johnson, for those comments. Uh, we'll go ahead with our roll call. Uh, Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Mr. Phipps has, excuse me, um, Mayor Pro Tem, um, Mr. Phipps has a question, a com question and comment for, oh. for the petition. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Phipps. Yeah, uh, did this one not have uh, uh, significant changes to the original plan? I do not show it listed. Uh, is Dave, did you want to comment on that? No, we, the driveway change was at zoning committee, correct? Yeah, no, the driveway change to reconfigure was at zoning committee, so there are no changes after zoning committee. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, where was I? I think I got Mr. Bakari, Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ashmira. Yes. And Mr. Phipps. Yes. Thank you. That passes. The next item is item number 14, petition 2021-190 by Blue Heel Development approximately 4.76 acres located on the north side of Wade Archery Road, south of Archery Cal Road and east of Marvin Road. That's Council District 7, Mr. Driggs District. It's currently zoned R3, single family residential and proposed zoning is R8, single family residential conditional. The zoning committee recommended six to zero to approve this petition and staff also recommends approval of this petition. So may I have a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee's Statement of Consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the Council's own and either approve or deny the petition? So moved. Moved to adopt and approve. Second. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winston. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, were there any comments? Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Uh, Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is item number 15. Petition 2021. Excuse me. Yes. Petition uh, 2021-196 by 3rd and Urban, approximately 21.51 acres of contiguous and non-contiguous parcels, generally adjacent to Berry Hill Road, Tuckasegee Road, Gesco Street, and J Street. And that's in Council District 3, Ms. Watlington's district. It's currently zoned I-2 General Industrial, and the proposed zoning is mixed-use development optional. The Zoning Committee voted 6-0 to zero to approve this petition and to recommend approval of the petition and staff also recommends approval of the petition. So may I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agenda and the screen as the council's own and either approve or deny the petition. Motion to adopt and approve. Second. Thank you. Any comments? Okay, Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. 
Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Newton? Mr. Yes. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Uh, I'm a yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Okay, thank you. The next item is petition uh, number 16, petition number 2021-202 by Trade Street Townhomes, Townhomes LLC, approximately 0.47 acres located at the northeast intersection of Willora Lake Road and Hollyfield Drive, east of Central Avenue in District 5, Mr. Newton's district. And there were changes to um, this petition uh, following the zoning committee's meeting. So the rezoning request was to allow up to 10 single family attached residential units at a density of 21.28 units per acre. And the following change was made it, um, after the zoning committee's recommendations. It adds note, a note um, committing to enhanced landscape screening plantings around the BMP. Uh, I don't know what that BMT state stands for if staff wants to, if that's material. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, just adding some uh, screening and landscaping around the retention pond that would be fronting uh, the the road frontage there. It's, it, when it's prominent in, the, in front of a project, we usually ask for additional screening and they commit it to that for us, so. Okay, great. And, and staff, of course, believes that this is a minor change and doesn't warrant going back to zoning com <laughs> committee. So may I have a motion to not send back to the zoning committee? Motion to not send back. Second. Thank you. Mr. Winston. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ejmira. Yes. And Mr. Phipps. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That passes. Item number 17 is 2021-206 by Madam Cambridge. Madam 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 we need yeah. to oh, that was just adopt and approve as well. I apologize. Yes, now I need a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agenda and the and the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition. Motion to adopt and approve. Second. Second. Any comment? Okay. Uh, Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I mean, yes, Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you, that passes. Now we go to item number 17 which is 2021-206 by Cambridge Properties, Inc., approximately 4.5 acres located on the west side of North Tryon Street, east of Interstate 85, and south of West Mallard Creek Church Road. That's District 4, Ms. Johnson's district. The, currently, uh, the current zoning is commercial center, and the proposed zoning is mixed-use development conditional with five-year vested rights and the zoning committee voted six to zero to recommend approval of this petition, and the staff recommends approval of this petition. May I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition? Mayor Pro Tem, before I make the motion, can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, um, in our notes, um, uh, Ms. Samuels, had some comments about her support and the removal of the five-year vesting. Yeah. Is there any update on that, or can we hear from Ms. Samuels and Mr. Patton if there's been an update? I'm not aware of an update. Um, the packet that I received does not indicate that vesting rights have been removed. Yeah, that's correct. So the vesting hasn't been removed. Staff did remove our comment to uh, do away with the five-year vesting after discussions with the applicant and petitioner uh, felt that it was a bit warranted given the complexity of the project. There's some different lease arrangements that need to be worked around, uh, and so we didn't have as much concern with it after we got a little bit more clarification. So we, we did rescind our 
uh, item as an outstanding issue and, and that five-year vesting would remain uh, intact should the petition be approved. Okay, good question. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second to on the motion to adopt and approve. Any other comments? Well, I just want to clarify, Ms. Samuels, is that what, what your concern was? Are you um, are you comfortable with the petition? No, I don't want to say comfortable, but what's your thought now with the petition? Because I'm not sure if I'm hearing two different things. Thank you for the question, Councilwoman Johnson. I'm, I'm not privy to the information that Dave has in terms of communication with the petitioner, so my hesitancy still exists. Okay, and, and can you clarify your hesitancy for the rest of council? Five-year vested rights um, is very rare on petitions that we see these days. I, I don't know of a situation in which we have in the past four years that I've been on Pine Commission. It just seems a bit out of place. Um, maybe if I had the information that Mr. Patton has, uh, that position might be a little bit different. Mayor Pro Tem, could I come in? Yes, Mr. Drakes. Oh. So I, I know from a discussion with the petitioner that in this case, if I remember this right, and correct me, Mr. Petten, uh, there are four quadrants basically to the property and the build out uh, is expected to take a long time. So uh, we do have these five year vested rights from time to time. I think this is an example of when they might be there. The developer basically doesn't want to start in the one quadrant, uh, embark on a plan that will take several years to complete and not have the assurance that the zoning for this piece uh, will stay in place. So I intend to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. Any other comment? Uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Phipps? Yes, it's my understanding that uh, this uh, is going to be a remake of this entire center uh, and uh, in terms of leases, I understand that uh, Food Lion there has a lease that runs for another 16 years. So in view of the longevity of that uh, particular uh, lease alone, I would think it would be warranted to have some sort of uh, benefit of this five-year vested rights to be able to uh, consummate uh, and make developments of this property as intended. Thanks. Thank you. Madam Mayor, Pro Tem. Sure, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, that's my understanding as well. And generally, um, you know, we have tried to reduce our use of um, five-year vested rights um, as, a, as a kind of a fallback. But we will utilize that as a tool um, for larger, um, larger um, uh, uh, projects that, again, as it was said already, may take longer and there's an interest um, uh, in, in, in ensuring that pro those projects get seen through completion um, and not end up with half done project um, um, in, 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 in community. So um, I, I am I'm okay with it in this sense, but in generally, it is something we do stay away from. Agreed. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, let's go with the roll call. Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Drapes? Yes. Mr. Eggles? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Uh, Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. That passes. Item number 18 is 2021-208 by Hugh Elder, approximately 2.94 acres located at the northwest intersection of Nations Ford Road and Forest Point Boulevard, north of West Arrowwood Road in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's district. It's currently zoned B1, which is Business and Shopping Center District. The proposed zoning is 01 Office. The zoning committee voted 6 to 0 to recommend approval of the petition, and staff also recommends approval of the petition. So may I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition. Motion to approve and adopt. Second. Thank you. Any comments? Thank you. Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Uh, Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Engels. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. 
Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. All right, that takes us to number 19, which is petition 2021-210 by Carter Acquisitions, LLC, approximately 25.17 acres, located on the south side of Moorhead Road, north of North Tryon Street, and east of Siloam Church Road. It's in the ETJ, which is uh, County Commission District 3, Mr. Dunlap's district. The closest city council district is District 4, Ms. Johnson's district. It's currently zoned 01 office conditional, and the proposed zoning is R12 multifamily condition, residential conditional. The zoning committee voted five to zero to recommend approval of this petition, and staff also recommends approval of this petition. May I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any comments? Uh, Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ejmira? Ms. Ejmira? Mr. Phipps. Yes. Thank you. That passes. Item number 20 is petition 2021-214 by the Adams Property Group. It's approximately 1.95 acres located at the northeast intersection of Rocky River Road and Woodland Beaver Road, north of Albemarle Road, also in the ETJ, County, uh, County Commission District 4, Mr. Jarrell's district, and the nearest council district is 5, Mr. Newton's district. It's currently zoned B1 Neighborhood Business Conditional, and the proposed zoning is MUD O, Mixed Use Development Optional. The Zoning Committee voted 5-0 to zero to recommend approval of this petition. Staff also recommends approval of this petition. May I have a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee's Statement of Consistency as it appears in our agendas and, the screen, and on the screen as the Council's own and approve or deny the petition? Motion to adopt and approve. Second. Any comments? Okay, Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Uh, I'm a yes, Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. That passes. The next item is item number 21, petition number 2021-215 by DHIC LLC and ReVenture Park Investments North LLC, approximately 102 acres north of Mount Holly Road and east of the Catawba River. It's in the ETJ Council, uh, County Commission District 1, Ms. Powell's District, and the nearest district is Mr. Graham's District, District 2. It's currently zoned Commercial Center Lake Wiley Critical Area and Light Industrial Lake Wiley Critical Area. And the proposed zoning is Mixed Use Innovative Lake Wiley Critical Area. The Zoning Committee voted 5-0 to zero to recommend approval of this petition and staff also recommends approval. So may I have a, a, um, a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee's Statement of Consistency as it appears in our agenda and the screen as the Council's own and approve or deny the petition? So Mayor Pro Tem, may I may I ask a question? I'm sorry. He moved it. Do you want to ask someone a seconds that I can ask the question? I'll Did second the motion. Okay, Ms. Johnson. I wanted to ask Ms. Kiva if she can give us an update or um, uh, on the position from the zoning committee. It looks like there was some uh, might be some, some concern, or if she can just give us an update or summary of the. Uh, the zoning committee discussion on this. Thank you for the question, Chairwoman Johnson. I think that the discussion here was more surrounding um, 
the feasibility of the petitioner or petitioner's agent to be able to, to uh, get permission from Duke Energy to build the two proposed boat docks. And uh, the request from uh, myself was that if the petitioner was not able to get permission from Duke Energy, if they would explore a different option with Met County Park and Rec um, for something that was more fitting and feasible for that second boat dock, I think is the one at the south portion of the petition. Um, and then secondly, the community members at Catawba Plantation uh, expressed concern that um, although this petition, uh, I believe the petitioner is seeking to voluntarily be annexed into the city, there was some confusion amongst those uh, community members as to whether or not their community would also be annexed as a result of this petition being annexed. Um, when I received those inquiries, of course, the, the, the answer is no. So I encourage those community members that were interested in annexation to reach out to our at-large uh, council members and to their Board of County Commission Rep, um, Commissioner Powell. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Samuel, Ms. Johnson. Uh, okay. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, just one item, just for housekeeping purposes on this one. Uh, it should actually be, it's correct on the uh, online agenda, but the presentation wasn't updated. It should be Long Branch Development rather than DHIC LLC. Just n no change to anything, just the name of the petitioner. Just wanted to update that for clarification. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's no other comments, we're with roll call. Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. That passes. Item number 22 is uh, petition number 2021-216 by DHIC LLC, approximately 41.26 acres, located on the west side of Old Holland Road, east of Interstate 85, and north of Moorhead Road. It's in the ETJ, County Commission District 3, Mr. Dunlap's district, and the nearest council district is District 4, Ms. Johnson's district. The current zoning is R3 single-family residential, the proposed zoning is R8 multifamily conditional residential conditional and the zoning committee voted five to zero to recommend approval of this petition. Staff also recommends approval of this petition and there were some changes made uh, after the zoning committee met. The petition uh, to develop, it, it's, a, it's a petition developed to develop a residential community with up to 198 multifamily apartments and up to 50 duplex style attached uh, dwelling units. The following changes were made after the committee's recommendation. Provides a 100 foot right turn lane on Old Holland Road at the Southern intersection. And it adds a note to the rezoning plan that the petitioner will offer to donate a conservation easement to the Catawba Lands Conservancy and to record a conservation easement agreement over 18.5 Three-three acre portion of the of the site. Um, staff rep believes that these changes are minor and does not warrant additional review by the committee, zoning committee. So may I have a recommendation to not send it back to the zoning committee? Motion not so to send back to the zoning committee. Second. Second. Any comment on that? Okay, Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes, Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Okay, great. Now may I have a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee Statement of Consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council zone and either approve or deny the petition? So moved to adopt, adopt and approve. Second. Okay, Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Uh, Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. 
I'm a yes. Uh, and Ms. Ajmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. That passes. Item number 23 is petition 2021-220 by Dependable Development, approximately 18.72 acres located on the south side of Beagle Club Road, east of Riverside Drive, and west of Mount Holly Huntersville Road. That's District 2, Mr. Graham's district. It's currently zoned R3, single family residential, and the proposed zoning is R8, single family residential. The zoning committee voted five to zero to recommend approval of this petition, and staff also recommends approval of the petition. May I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agendas and the screen as the council's own and approve or deny the petition? Adopt and approve. Second. Okay, any comment? All right, Mr. Winston? Yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Uh, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes, Ms. Ejmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, I'm also a yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Johnson. That's okay. Thank you. Um, so that passes. And our last decision for the night is item number 24, which is 2021-227 by Graham Partners, LLC, approximately 3.02 acres, located on the west side of Old Providence Road, east of Providence Lane West, and north of Ray Road. That's Mr. Uh, Driggs District, Council District 7. It's currently zoned R3 single family residential, and the proposed zoning is R4 single family residential. The zoning committee voted five to zero to approve, recommend approval of this petition, and staff recommends approval of this petition. May I have a motion to adopt the zoning committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our, uh, in our agenda and the screen as the council's own, and approve or deny the petition? Move to adopt and approve. Second. Any comments? Okay, uh, Mr. Winston. Yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Ejmira. Yes. And Mr. Phipps. Yes. Great. Thank you. And with that, I am that it, that does it for our one more on the agenda. I'm we looking. do have yeah, we have one we have one more. one added after the agenda was printed. It's item twenty four B in its petition twenty twenty one dash two zero zero. Okay, I'm going to ask if Mr. Winston would read that then, since I don't have that with me in my packet. Yes, one one moment. It also didn't get added to the presentation by our oversight. Apologies for that, but we will get it read in. So petition 2021 uh, by C5100 LLC, and it is going from R5 to R8 MF uh, multifamily conditional. Uh, staff recommends approval. Zoning committee recommended approval five to one on their uh, recommendation. And let's see. Yeah, they were five to one uh, with their recommendation. I will get the slide put together and get that posted as soon as possible here in just a few. Uh, so just bear with us for one moment. Apologies. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, it's approximately 3.21 acres located on the east side of Wildwood Avenue, north of South Hoskins Road, and west of Rosals Ferry Road in Mr. Graham's district, too. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. It takes a village sometimes. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Winston, I can go ahead and read the consistency statement and take a vote if that's... Yes, ma'am. ...good with you. So I would need a motion to adopt the Zoning Committee's statement of consistency as it appears in our agenda, and the screen is the council's own and approve or deny the petition. Adopt and approve. Second. Thank you. Any comments? 
we okay. send it out after. Yeah. Mr. Winston? It's, it's on the online agenda. Yeah. No. Okay, Mr. Winston's a no. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Uh, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. I'm a yes. Ms. Esmira? Yes. And Mr. Phipps? Yes. Okay, that does pass. Okay, and I believe that then that was Yeah, that was the last one. Again, apologies for that oversight. Okay, no problem. Thank you for uh, helping me out there, everybody. Okay, with that, that concludes our zoning decisions, and I will turn it over at this point to Mr. Um, Winston to uh, start the hearings. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, one question for you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and, and Ms. Hagler Gray. Uh, do we need to make a motion to excuse Mayor Pro Tem? Are, are you are you you're sticking around? No, I'm not going to be able to. I can probably get through one hearing. All right. So sh okay. No, you'll just let us know when you're leaving, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. Yeah, because we don't take a vote at, on these. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, Next up is agenda item number 26, rezoning petition 2021-233 uh, by Hopper Communities, um, approximately 6.52 acres located on the south side of Enhaven Lane and west side of Elm Lane in Council District 7, Mr. Driggs. Current zoning is R3 single family residential and the proposed zoning is R12 multifamily residential co conditional. Uh, staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to environment and site and building design uh, and technical re revisions related to site and building design. Uh, we do have um, a, a, a speaker against this. Um, so after Mr. Petten's uh, presentation, uh, the petitioner will have 10 minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, 2021 233. That's about six and a half acres on Elm Lane, End Haven, just on the north side of uh, I-485. Uh, the current zoning is R3. Proposed zoning is R12 multifamily conditional. Uh, adopted future land uses from the South District Plan. That recommended up to three dwelling units per acre. Uh, given the date of the plan, we do run general development policies, and that did come in uh, and qualify for uh, up to eight dwelling units per acre. The petition as proposed is for up to 52 single family attached dwelling units. That comes in at 7.98 units per acre, which is just below that uh, GDP recommendation of eight. <clears throat> those limit maximum building height to 40 feet, which is our standard residential building height in those zoning districts uh, in the R districts. Uh, does provide architectural design standards for exterior building materials, roof, pitched roofs, and covered front stoops and blank walls. Also, each unit would have a garage and commit to a minimum of 15 visitor parking spaces throughout the site. Uh, units may include a rooftop terrace, uh, except for uh, some of those that uh, uh, face uh, the western property line where you've got residences behind them. Uh, it does provide a buffer that's greater than the 30 foot width requirement, uh, and they come in with a 37 and a half foot wide buffer and a six foot fence along that western property line shown in green. Uh, it does commit to a central green and amenity space of at least 4,000 square feet. Uh, and then also constructs an eight foot wide planning strip and six foot wide sidewalk along Enhaven Lane. Uh, the recently constructed planning strip and sidewalk on Elm Lane and the 485 bridge would remain in place. And also installs a westbound turn lane uh, going left on Enhaven at the site's vehicular access point. As mentioned, staff does recommend approval to have some outstanding issues related to environment, site and building design, and technical revisions related to site and building design to work through. As mentioned, it's inconsistent with the South District Plan, but it is consistent with the GDP for up to eight dwelling units per acre. And we'll be happy to take any questions following presentation from the petitioner and the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petten. Uh, we have four speakers for Clay McCullough, Bart Hopper, Nick Bouchon, um, and John Carmichael, who is in the room, uh, assuming that you will take care of all four of those. I will. Thank you. Um, Ten minutes, Mr. Carmichael. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Winston, members of City Council and the Zoning Committee. I'm John Carmichael. With me tonight is Clay McCullough of Hopper Communities. Nick Bouchon, the Design Resources Group, should be online. Um, next slide. Uh, as Mr. Petten stated, the site contains just over six and a half acres. It's located on the south side of Enhaven Lane, at basically at the intersection of Enhaven Lane and Elm Lane. 
I-45 is immediately to the south of the site, as you can see. Next slide. This is just an aerial photograph of the site. It's outlined in green. Next slide. And that's a zoomed in aerial photograph of the site. Next slide. Uh, this is the zoning map. The site is currently zoned R3. Next slide. And the petitioner is requesting that the site be rezoned from the R3 zoning district to the R12 MFCD zoning district to allow up to 52 single family attached townhome dwelling units on the site. As Mr. Petten indicated, the, the density is just under eight units an acre and the GDP supported up to eight units an acre. Next slide. This is the rezoning plan. Uh, the site would be accessed from Inhaven Lane. Uh, there would be a, le a westbound left turn lane installed by the petitioner on Inhaven Lane at the access point into the site. The individual dwelling units would be accessed from the internal private streets. Uh, each dwelling unit would have a garage and uh, there would be a minimum of 15 visitor parking spaces on the site. Petitioner would install an eight foot planing strip and a six foot sidewalk along the site's frontage on Inhaven Lane. That coupled with the new bridge on Elm Lane over I-45 would enable residents to walk from this site uh, to Stonecrest, the commercial uses at Stonecrest. Uh, there would be a 50 foot rear yard established along the western boundary of the site next to the Bearwick community. Within that 50 foot rear yard would be a 37 and a half foot wide class C buffer with a six foot tall wooden privacy fence. Uh, the, a portion of the site's tree save area would also be located within that 37 and a half foot uh, buffer. Uh, at the request of the Bearwick HOA board, the petitioner is committing that that six foot tall wooden screen fence would be located a minimum of 20 feet from the western boundary line of the site. Uh, there would be a community green, as Mr. Petten stated. Architectural standards are part of the rezoning plan. Uh, the maximum building height would be 40 feet. Um, we have met several times with representatives of the adjacent neighborhood, and we've been working with the HOA board and the president, Mr. Todd Zulu. As a result of those conversations, the petitioners made some additional commitments that I'd like to share with you tonight. One was to pay for the installation of a speed bump on Inhaven Lane between the entrance to Berwick and Elm Lane if approved by CDOT. I will say that we talked about that with Mr. Zulo before I read the pre-hearing staff analysis and apparently CDOT's looked at that and determined that a speed bump cannot be installed between Berwick and Elm, but we would like to work on behalf of Mr. Zulu and the board and the residents of Berwick on if there is something we can do between uh, Megwood which is to the left, to the west of the site, and Elm Lane along our frontage in an effort to help with, uh, to provide some sort of traffic calming, and we'd love the opportunity to talk with CDOT about that. A second commitment was to, I don't know if this pointer works. I don't think it does. There's a, um, there's a brick wall on the, uh, on the adjacent, the, 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 pro, the parcel located at the uh, intersection of Megwood Drive and Inhaven Lane it's right beside the site, has a brick wall, about a six foot tall brick wall located on a portion of that lot. The HA board has asked the petitioner to extend that brick wall along the northern boundary of that parcel, which the northern boundary is next to Inhaven Lane, and connect that brick wall to the six foot tall wooden uh, privacy fence in the buffer. And the petitioner has agreed to do that subject to three conditions, and I th I'm sure you'll understand those conditions when I share those with you. One is that we have to get the consent of that property owner because it would involve the removal of some trees and shrubs, and we need to get a temporary construction easement from that property owner. Um, I don't think that wall's in the right-of-way, but to the extent that any portion would be in the right-of-way, a condition would be getting an encroachment agreement from CDOT. And then, um, uh, another condition is that the extension of the brick wall will not require the relocation of any utilities. And finally, that the extension of that brick wall is permitted under the applicable ordinances. Uh, and then the third thing that we worked with the board on was, and I previously mentioned this, that the fence would be a minimum of 20 feet from that western boundary line. We appreciate all the time that the, the residents of the community and the board, Mr. Zulu, have provided to us to discuss this matter with them. We appreciate the staff's favorable recommendation and we'll uh, work this week to resolve the outstanding issues 
then once again, we'd appreciate any opportunity to have a conversation with CDOT about what, if anything, can be done along the frontage to provide traffic calming on In Heaven Lane. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Carmichael. Yeah. Um, I think you have more time. Does anybody on your team want to say anything That's else? It. All right, thank you. Uh, like I said, we do have um, opposition. Um, Micah Cohen um, uh, is an op Mr. Cohen, thank you for joining us. Uh, you have 10 minutes once you get to the podium. Thank you. And, sir, if you could go to that brown podium. I'm, I, didn't, I meant to catch Mr. Carmichael, and I didn't. And it's okay, Mr. Carmichael. Just You'll okay? be up plenty more. <laughs> Do I have a mic? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as a resident of the neighborhood under discussion, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I appreciate um, the attention that Hopper has given to our community. We've met many times, and they're, they're very friendly. Um, I don't want to speak now um, about the loss of privacy or the loss of a small natural wildlife area or questions of water runoff or the introduction of light and noise and trash pollution that will all be a result of this proposed development. I would like to speak only to the issue of traffic on the small connector road, End Haven Lane, into which this development plans to feed. You can't see it here, but there are approximately 525 homes in the existing neighborhoods that currently feed directly on End Haven Lane. According to standard road planning approximations, this alone would be over 1,000 cars accessing End Haven from these homes daily. Plus, there are two massive apartment complexes with over 1,500 units, adding approximately 1,500 more cars, two hotels, two soon to be three schools with hundreds of children and their parents walking and driving to school, all adding traffic to this small two-lane connector road. End Haven Lane, it's less than a mile long. Standard road planning approximation would consider this to be about 3,000 cars, each making multiple trips per day. Tens of thousands of cars are traveling on End Haven every day. And this doesn't include waves of school buses twice a day, and delivery vehicles, and maintenance vehicles, and importantly, emergency vehicles. Even in normal times, the residents of my neighborhood, which are right to the west, we already have trouble uh, exiting our neighborhood between 4 and 7 because of school and work traffic backed up at the traffic light just beyond where this new development plans to connect to End Haven Lane. This new development, as uh, he just mentioned, would be 52 units, each with the ability to park four cars, which is up to 200 more cars and exponentially more trips. It will have only one entrance and exit onto the already crowded End Haven Lane, very close to an existing traffic light where cars already stack up. This plan, with all these cars, seems thoughtless at best and a recipe for small road gridlock at worst. On behalf of my neighbors, I ask that the zoning, commi that the, that the zoning committee truly consider the impact of so much more traffic on this small local road upon which we all rely. And I appreciate you listening to me today. I appreciate Hopper and their attention too. Uh, and I have copies of my notes if you need them. Well, if you would like to share your notes with council, you can definitely give a copy to the clerk and she will ensure that it gets to all of us. Okay, thank uh, you. Mr. Carmichael, you have two minutes to re for a rebuttal if you choose to use it. Uh, thank you, my council member. Once no real rebuttal other than to say we certainly understand his concerns. Um, this development would generate about 355 trips according to CDOT. Uh, development under the current zoning would generate about 230. Um, there is a lot of development that's planned to go on the far west end of Inhaven Lane. We certainly acknowledge that. Uh, once again, not to beat this to death, but we'd love to work with CDOT on any sort of traffic calming that could be done along the site's frontage on Inhaven Lane, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carmichael. Um, now we'll start with our council questions and discussion. Um, I, I do have a question uh, for uh, CDOT. I mean, it does seem to be both petitioner and um, a community desire to see some traffic calm in there. Understood that um, a speed, traditional speed bump is inappropriate. Um, I would imagine it has something to do with emergency vehicles. Um, have we explored um, those, s not speed bumps, but those spread speed calmers, I don't even know the official name of it this time, that, that accommodates 
uh, emergency vehicles? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you're referring to the speed cushions that we've been putting down in some places around the city. Um, it's my understanding that it, it's due to the proximity of this development to Elm Lane is why we can't implement traffic calming. There are traffic calming measures at multiple places along in Haven once you go to the west of this development. Uh, but it's my understanding that our safety group has not approved traffic calming due to the proximity to Elm Lane and it needed to be 600 feet minimum distance from an intersection. Um, I, I'm definitely uh, receptive to circling back with them and see if we can find some kind of alternate solution here or, uh, you know, any kind of um, way we can get around something else that will address the, the speeds here. Thank you. I, I would appreciate that. And I do have a follow up question to Mr. Carmichael and your team. Um, is there, uh, uh, separate from speed bumps or speed cushions, um, have you explored or is there a possibility to do anything with the design of the entrance that acts as a, um, a traffic calming, um, um, I don't know, uh, item? I know that there's plenty of innovative things that are going on around um, design. We, we have not. Uh, the. I don't know if Mr. Bichon's on the 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 design just meets the city's driveway standards and we are they are putting the left turn lane that was a I guess a request to CDOT to do so and that's that's one thing that they're implementing but but I, I don't know if Mr. Bichon's on or not he's supposed to be but um, I am good okay, afternoon sorry. not calling you out <laughs> Hey, this is Nick Bouchon from Design Resource Group. Uh, yeah, we analyze driveway locations uh, connecting to Enhaven uh, across the frontage. And really, we had to factor in uh, existing topography. And the location shown is the current high point. And uh, we need to maintain site distance. So that was something we analyzed right on the front end from a design perspective. And uh, really, we're limited. The location shown is the best uh, location to factor in site distance, which is a... a safety measure that needs to be maintained uh, during permitting. Thank you. Does uh, anybody else from council have any questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Winston, it's Ed Driggs. You're recognized. So uh, the End Haven is a big problem. End Haven was a cul-de-sac until not that long ago. Uh, recently, there was a traffic light installed at Elm and End Haven. Um, that particular location right near the end of Enthaven does present a challenge. And I mentioned this to residents when we were talking about it, that, that having a speed bump so close to a light was, uh, was not something that was likely to work. I think we can, we can continue to look at this. I have asked CDOT as well to consider lighting on Enthaven because it's also a very dark street. And with all of those schools and things, uh, I think we need to pay more attention to Enthaven. Um, and uh, but, but so far, there are advantages to this petition related to the sidewalk and the way it wraps around and connects with the bridge and so on. So I, I think this is basically a good plan. And, and we have questions, bigger questions that we need to address about End Haven and the sufficiency of that road. So we'll keep working on that. Thank you. I see no other. I have name. a question. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Johnson. I'm sorry. Um, the resident mentioned quite a, uh, quite a lot of development. Um, and I wanted to know, it, it sounds like there's a cumulative effect and I keep talking about the cumulative effect. I wanted to know if, um, uh, if the resident, if he's still there, if he's still at the podium, if he can kind of you repeat what you, you said, you mentioned like a thousand new trips or something, and you, you mentioned schools. If you could just um, speak to that again. And then I'd like to ask Mr. Petten if we can get a cumulative report that surrounds this petition, um, such as the one we had in District 4, maybe the approved development in the last two years um, within maybe a two mile radius or something, um, so that we as council can really start to see what's going on around these petitions. We can't be expected to remember everything that, you know, that we see each month. So if we can really start having an idea of how these developments are pieced together, you know, the residents, when they talk about this, the lack of infrastructure and the traffic and the cumulative effect, you know, I, I know that's something I've been asking for for a long time. So if we could 
see this. I mean, I, I would hope my, I would ask my colleagues if we could ask that from zoning to, to be included in the zoning petition, the same way that the UDO goals are included. So I just think this is, um, that our residents are really feeling the weight of, of all of this development, and it would really, really help us um, to, to be able to connect these dots. So if the resident can speak again and, and just repeat what he said yeah. as far as all of the development in this area, I'd like to be able to capture that, please. I, I really appreciate that very much. Um, End Haven Lane is less than a mile long, and there are uh, two massive apartment complexes. There are two hotels. There are two, soon to be three, schools. Uh, there are hundreds of children uh, walking on the street and parents picking up and driving their kids every day. Um, and uh, there are 525 homes in the neighborhoods that feed directly and only onto End Haven Lane, this little mile, less than a mile. Um, and there's something that I, I did some research, there's something called a standard road planning approximation, which is uh, a, a certain amount of cars per unit and a certain amount of trips per day. Uh, and I don't need that kind of stuff to know that from like four to seven, uh, we have trouble getting on to End Haven Lane because uh, traffic stacks up behind that light and it stacks up all the way west of, uh, of uh, Berwick. Um, and so I'm, I, I would just ask, we, like I said, I appreciate everybody understanding this cumulative effect. Um, and, and I know that the developer understands this too. Um, but this is a real problem on this tiny little connector street with all this development. So uh, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Okay. So, um, Mr. Winston, if I can just speak to CDOT. I've worked with CDOT um, That's what I was just about. and while traffic or TIS wasn't required, there was something else that we asked the developer for. Um, it's not the actual traffic information report, but if there's something, if we can just get some more information regarding this petition, and uh, I, with all due respect to the district rep, we, we do rely on, on his knowledge, but this, this you know, a one mile street, that just sounded like a lot of uh, growth around this area. So I, um, I hope we pay, and I know that we pay attention to all of the development, but this sounded uh, extreme. So I'd like some information on that, on this development. But again, I'd ask my colleagues if we could continue to ask zoning for a cumulative report until we change that policy. If that's something that we could, we could get, I think that that would, that would really help us to manage the growth and, 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 and take a step back and, and make sure our residents know that we, that we hear them. Thank you. Yep, and we can coordinate um, with, with CDOT and other departments on getting that information together for this one. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing that. Any other questions? Mr. Mr. Carmichael, did you have a second? Oh, we have a motion uh, and a second to close the public hearing. Uh, don't need further discussion. I'm a yes. Mr. Bukhari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Is Mayor Pro Tem still with us? Yes. Right. Um, Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That moves us along uh, to agenda item number 27. Uh, rezoning petition uh, 2021-79 by Piedmont Capital LLC, which is approximately 7.88 acres located on the north side of North Wendover Road, west of Monroe Road, and east of Randolph Road in Council District 1, Mr. Eggleston's district. The current zoning is B1 uh, neighborhood business conditional, um, and the proposed zoning is NSB2 neighborhood services and general business conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to environment and site and building design. Um, we have no speakers against, um, and um, several speakers, which I, I believe Mr. Brown will be coordinating. Um, Mr. Brown, you'll have three minutes after uh, staff's presentation. 
Thank right, you. Thank you. 2021 7.88 acres on North Wendover Road. Uh, the current zoning of the property is B1 conditional, and the proposed zoning is NS as well as B2 conditional. The adopted future land use from the Independence Boulevard area plan does call for retail land uses for the site, so the requests for both those districts would be consistent. Uh, the proposal itself uh, allows for uses in the NS district for an existing shopping center, uh, does allow for 3,500 square feet of limited service EDE with drive through and then 500 square feet of outdoor seating area. Uh, that'd be for a portion of an existing retail building. Uh, and then also would create a new out parcel with a proposed 4,000 square foot EDE with drive through and 750 square foot outdoor area. Uh, also construct new internal pedestrian sidewalks from uh, those EDE uses to North Wendover Road. Also propose new parking areas in the rear of the main building. Uh, proposes installation of a traffic signal at Beale Street and Wendover Road. Uh, and also a 12 foot wide multi-use path uh, along that frontage on Wendover as well. It does specify proposed exterior building materials uh, like minimum percent of masonry material, minimum transparency, limit expanse of blank walls, uh, and new buildings will present a front or side facade to public streets. Also illustrates a five foot wide planting area with evergreen shrubs along a portion of the property line. If we can stay on this slide one moment, Holly, just to give folks some reference. This is uh, the shopping center on Wendover with I believe a food line. The EDE with drive through on the left was an existing uh, credit union. Uh, Beale Street, if some of y'all are familiar with this area, uh, lots of kind of in and out movement from uh, the post office there and folks going back and forth between those two intersections. So a proposed uh, traffic signal there is certainly, I think something that would be a welcome addition for folks that are going along that corridor. If you've been in that area, you certainly would be aware of that as well. But just wanted to give everybody a little bit of context on this shopping center. Uh, as mentioned, staff does recommend approval of this petition. Uh, do have some outstanding issues related to environment and site and building design to be resolved. As mentioned, it is consistent with the Independence Boulevard area plan, uh, and we'll be happy to take any questions following Mr. Brown's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Mr. Brown, you have three minutes. Good evening, uh, Councilmember Winston, Council Members Colin Brown on behalf of the petitioner's team. I'm going to speak, speak quickly since we only have three minutes. Good overview by Dave. Uh, this is the old Food Lion Shopping Center. Um, certainly, um, I think could use some love and some reinvestment. Uh, the development team engaged with uh, leadership in the Greer Heights community over a year ago uh, to you know, put this on, on their radar and get feedback. Uh, the number one concern we heard from the neighborhood was the importance of maintaining that grocery store, the food line grocery store that is there. Uh, they are, are coming up on the end of the lease and I think one thing that Food Lion wants to see is some reinvestment in that center. And so that, that's really the driver here. As Dave mentioned, uh, the, the real addition is a new drive through here along Wendover. But that investment from that tenant will allow the entire center to be upgraded. Uh, the development team uh, hopes to keep all tenants that want to remain. Uh, as Dave mentioned, there's an existing drive through for the state employees credit union. Uh, that business is leaving. They're building a new building around the corner, so they're vacating. And we would use that opportunity to insert a new business there with a drive through Just to be transparent, and this, these are not zoning commitments, but I know that people like to know the potential tenants that we are talking about in the end cap where the um, this credit unit is uh, could be a Starbucks. Uh, the large restaurant out front there on Wendover uh, could be a Chick-fil-A. And then the inline, an inline tenant we hope to add would be a Goodwill. Uh, I mentioned that these are, you know, Chick-fil-A generates significant traffic. And we've been talking a while with CDOT about improvements, but what was important to the neighborhood was keeping a couple of those key retailers, especially the grocery, and adding tenants that can provide good jobs with benefits in the area, attainable jobs. And so even though I want to be clear, this is not a commit, these tenants are not a commitment of our rezoning, uh, but this is who this zoning would accommodate. Um, approximately 150 plus jobs. Uh, this investment would stabilize the center. This is not a scrape that you see sometimes where new development comes in, takes everything down and comes in with a, a totally new gentrified center. I know these, uh, these uses, a couple of them on here are 
maybe the definition of some gentry uses, uh, but blending that in with the existing grocery store, and we hope a Goodwill will provide a good tenant mix, allow this to be a sustainable uh, development that will continue to serve a larger part of the area, as well as the neighborhood uh, from a retail perspective and hopefully an employment perspective. Um, happy to answer any questions you may have. I uh, have the development team as well as our engineer on with me. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I think we could all use a little love and reinvestment at some point in time. Um, do you know, uh, I do have a question. Uh, would that Chick-fil-A uh, be a Chick-fil-A that replaces the one basically around the corner um, in Cotswold, or would that be an additional one in the area? Um, I, I don't want to speak on Chick-fil-A's behalf, but it's funny, Mr. Winston, as we talk about this, it's almost like schools. It, my understanding is this would be a relief Chick-fil-A. So it would not, I do not believe it would replace Cotswold, but we do think it would take some traffic from there. What a time to be alive. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I definitely would have uh, some concerns about uh, the backup of Chick-fil-A um, into Wendover Road. Um, uh, that, that, that could be um, concerning. Um, so I really don't know how to deal with that from a land use perspective right now for a potential resident, um, but it's something I would like to keep um, our eyes on. And I think you could follow up with CDOT on that. Um, this is one of the benefits of the center is there is enough area of queuing to get them off the street. And CDOT has paid close attention to other improvements that will make that function that way. Thank you, Mr. Eggleston. Thank you, Mr. Winston. Um, and thank you, Mr. Brown. I was gonna say what was just said, which is that uh, this parking lot is actually where we stage all the cars for the Greer Heights uh, parades that take place. So it does have some room there and hopefully with the sort of comprehensive rehab of the center, uh, they can think comprehensively about how to accommodate that queuing. Um, but I do like the investment here and the grocery store there is critical um, because it does serve communities that otherwise would not be served with a full service grocery store. So I'm glad to see um, that this is not a teardown, that this is a reinvestment and in a corridor where we do need more jobs, we do need more um, services and amenities, and I think this can be a good addition to um, that stretch of Wendover. So I don't know if, if you don't have any other questions, I'll make the motion to close. Um, Mr. Second. Mr. Phipps does have a question. Of course he does. Yeah, Mr. Brown, you indicated that uh, as a result of uh, refurbishing the center, that uh, that would be available for tenants who would want to remain. Do we have any indication that the food lion would still want to serve as the anchor tenant of that center? Yeah, I want to be careful. I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, our, our understanding is they are looking for some investment and stabilization uh, in that area and then hopefully willing to stay. Um, William Hodges, if, if you're on and have a different or better answer to that, I welcome you to chime in. So there is uh, a little over two years remaining in the lease. Um, it is, is not ideal performing store for them. Um, but with this investment, they have given us indication that they would intend to stay if the sales um, corresponded with the improvements that we made, which we do foresee being the case. In, you know, Mr. Phipps, thank you for that question, because um, that would be a concern of mine. I know one of the priorities that we have is around food deserts. Um, and as we know, right around the corner on Cotswold, we have one of those spots that where we have the supermarket wars um, between Publix, Harris Teeter, um, and others. Um, I, I would not want the collateral, uh, any type of collateral damage to, to, to create a new food desert um, in a place uh, like Greer Heights to make it more fresh food, more inaccessible. So I, I hope that's something that the petitioner, Mr. Eggleston, and I'm happy to um, talk about over this, this next month to see if there's anything that we can do um, to ensure that that negative effect does not occur. But we have no more speakers, and with that, I'd um, entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Second. Um, I'm a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? 
Mr. Driggs? Mr. Driggs appears to have stepped away. Okay. Uh, no vote. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Uh, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Eisel is here. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Winston, point of order. Yes, Ms. Johnson? Um, you mentioned Mr. Drake's was a no vote because he stepped away. He's not a no. He is. Okay. He's a yes vote? No, no. He's a, there's no vote counted, oh. correct? Yes. Yeah. Hold, hold on. Just to answer your question, just to answer your specific question, I'll, yes. I'll have Ms. Hagler Gray answer it. Yeah. It appears that he is still connected but has stepped away, therefore, he's still part of the meeting. So he, that would be a yes vote. Thank you very much. With, we will move on to agenda item number 28, uh, rezoning petition 2021-119 by Profile Homes, approximately 30.16 acres located on the southwest side of Freedom Drive, east of Toddville Road and north of Tuckasegee Road in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's district. The current zoning is R3 single family residential, Lower Lake Wiley protected area, um, uh, institutional Lower Lake Wiley protected area um, and mixed use innovative Lower Lake Wiley protected area. The proposed zoning um, is MX2 mixed use innovative Lower Lake Wiley protected area. Um, MX2 mixed use innovative Lower Lake Wiley protected area site plan amendment. Uh, the staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of requested technical revisions related to site and building design. Again, we have no speakers um, against. So after uh, the presentation by Mr. Petten, um, we'll hear from um, Bridget Grant, Tom Small, and John Holton. All right, thank you. 2021-119, uh, it's just over 30 acres, 31 acres. Uh, on Freedom Drive between Toddville Road and Allenbrook Drive. Uh, it's currently zoned R3, uh, Institutional and MX2, all carry the Lower Lake Wiley Protected Area uh, overlay. And then the proposed zoning is for MX2 Innovative and MX2 Innovative Site Plan Amendment, still maintaining that Lower Lake Wiley Protected Area overlay. The Northwest District Plan adopted in 1990 does recommend residential up to eight dwelling units per acre, single family up to four dwelling units per acre, as well as greenway uses for the site. Uh, the proposed uh, development with this petition would uh, allow for the development of up to 146 single family attached dwelling units that would come in at a density of 4.63 units per acre, limit building height to 48 feet, <clears throat> does request the following optional provisions, or excuse me, innovative provisions, that would be a 14 foot setback from existing or proposed back of curb, a six foot side and rear yard, and then a minimum sublot area of 1200 square feet, along with a width of 22 feet. Does commit to several transportation improvements, including an installation of an eight foot planning strip and six foot sidewalk along all public street frontages, public street connections to Burke Drive, Pine Book Drive, Woodford Lane, and Leaf Tree Drive, as well as construction of ADA curb ramps at the intersection of Toddville Road and Leaf Tree Drive, uh, construction of a left turn lane on northbound Freedom Drive at Woodford Lane. Also commits to architectural details, uh, including specified building materials, covered entryways, blank wall limitations, uh, and porches and stoops on all corner units facing a public street. Also commits to providing 3.12 acres of open space with landscaping, seating, and lighting. Staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of technical revisions related to site and building design. Uh, it is consistent uh, for a portion of the site that recommends up to eight DUA. Uh, <clears throat> however, it is inconsistent with another portion of the site that only recommends up to four DUA and inconsistent with those institutional land use recommendations. Uh, the petition overall is consistent with the GDP for up to six dwelling units per acre, and we'll be happy to take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to assume that Ms. Grant is coordinating the three speakers. Um, Ms. Grant, you have three minutes. I am. Um, good evening, members of council, members of the zoning committee. Bridget Grant, land use consultant with Moran Van Allen, and I'm pleased to be here with Tom Small with Profile Homes and John Holcomb with Kimberly Horn. As always, Dave did a great job with his presentation, so I'm, I'm not, these nights can be pretty long. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, as you mentioned, our request is consistent with 
generally consistent with the adopted land use policy. We're proposing 146 residential units. And it changes from being a townhome product that was originally surface parked under the original rezoning to a townhome development with individual garages, most of which are rear loaded. The plan extends multiple street networks throughout the area, provides architectural commitments, and is a continuation of a phased development. I think that color renderings are always a little easier to read. So this clearly depicts the existing buildings are shown in light gray or, or white, and you can see where in the color portion of the slide, we're adding those additional buildings, a combination of principally rear loaded units with some front loaded towards the northern side of the site. Um, we are pleased to have staff support and we'll be able to address any of those outstanding issues by the time we submit later this week. And we're happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for the petitioner? From, from any council member? Motion to close public hearing. Second. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm a yes. Um, Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Uh, Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you all very much. We'll move on to item number 29, rezoning petition 2021-125 by Red Sea Properties. Uh, approximately 133.09 acres located on the south side of University City Boulevard, northeast of Interstate 85 and east of Back Creek Church Road in the ETJ um, uh, in uh, County Commission District 3, which is Mr. Dunlap's and is closest to uh, City Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's. The current zoning R3 single family residential, R4 single family residential, and BD distributive business um, is being proposed to change to MX2 innovative or mix, mixed use innovative with five year vested rights. Um, staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation, environment, and site and building design. Uh, we do not have any speakers against, so um, after the uh, petitioner, we'll have three minutes um, after Mr. Petten's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. 2021 uh, 133 acres uh, located on the south side of University City Boulevard, uh, just on the uh, uh, northeast side of Interstate 485. It's currently zoned R3, R4, and BD. Uh, the proposed zoning is for MX2 Innovative, uh, as well as a requesting for five-year vested rights. The adopted future land use from the Rocky River Road area plan does recommend utility, greenway, and warehouse distribution uses on the site. Uh, the proposal itself is to develop 184 single-family attached alley-loaded units and 397 single-family detached lots that would be broken up into three different phases, phase 1A, 1B, and 2. Phase 1A would have 217 single-family lots and 88 townhomes, 1B, 26 single-family lots, and then phase 2, 154 single family lots and 96 townhomes. Does include a bridge uh, between those phases in 1A and 1B. You can see that down there in that area uh, where the green dashed line is. There's a purple connection there that uh, denotes the bridge connection. Does have uh, several transportation improvements, including new street connectivity and extensions, a multi use path extension along Caldwell Park Road to the county owned parcel, uh, as well as a no build area for a potential sound barrier along I 485 as well as adjustments to turning lanes at several intersections and new signals at two intersections, restriping and construction of pedestrian facilities. We do have architectural standards proposed uh, relating to porches and stoops, architectural details for corner and end units, blank walls, et cetera. Uh, also installs a 50 foot wide buffer along portions of the site's property line uh, with a planted berm or opaque fence along the railroad right of way and along that I-485 frontage. Uh, and tall fencing with no gates on the common open space area between the proposed berm and the railroad right-of-way. Uh, it does dedicate greenway area on the south side of Back Creek, uh, which you can see in that uh, dotted green line MCPR dedication. Uh, that would extend the existing greenway to the right-of-way of I-485. 
uh, and Greenway access easement to connect to Abercrombie Street to the Greenway would be provided as well, along with a minimum two and a half acre amenity area and proposed trail network throughout the site. Staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation, environment, and site and building design. Uh, it is inconsistent with those recommendations in the Rocky River Road area plan. Uh, however, just the continued uh, development in this area, a lot of that uh, land use recommendation, particularly for the warehousing and distribution, uh, is more related to some of the BD existing zoning that's out there. Uh, but staff does feel this is a, an appropriate transition from those recommendations and that greenway uh, connection that's recommended it does provide a little bit of consistency as well with that area plan recommendation. So we'll be happy to take any questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petten. And we do have six speakers um, in favor. I'm assuming Mr. Brown, are you speaking um, on behalf of all six? Yes, sir. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Cause I only have three minutes. I will speak quickly. I'll kind of skip through our introductions. Um, if I could get our um, presentation up, that'd be great. But again, uh, Colin Brown, on behalf of the petitioner uh, plan, I appreciate Dave's thoroughness um, in going through our slides as we have very limited time. Uh, get our slide to advance. There we go. Uh, I would point out this is on the very periphery. This is a, about as far as you can get. So our property here abuts uh, Cabarrus County on the edge. This is Harrisburg beyond us. Uh, and what's interesting, this is 133 acres, a very large development. And Brittany and I were just speaking, it is, it is very low density. Uh, so we're at less than four and a half units per acre. And this is the first rezoning that I can recall that we've handled that has this many single family homes. Um, most of the new development that we're seeing in areas like this, as you know, are from townhomes. And so what's interesting is this is almost 400 single family lots. Uh, it does have some townhomes, so really providing some diverse housing choices out here. Here's a colored version of the plan, so you can really see how much green space there, there is uh, on the site. Uh, here's a network, as, as Dave mentioned, we're having some connectivity to uh, some greenways that are planned, showing an internal trail system, and then a larger view to show you how this development would integrate into Caldwell Park, the park which is actually being planned. The road Dave mentioned is being extended uh, through that area to our site. Our secondary access point will be here to the south. Um, so I think uh, good positives, I think uh, multiple housing types, everyone knows that we are have high demand for housing and this is new housing, single family and towns at a, at a very relatively low density. Street connections uh, that I mentioned, Dave reviewed uh, several of the significant transportation improvements that will be made. Uh, we're, we're happy to be able to provide multi-use paths internal to our development extending into Caldwell Park and the county owned parkland. Uh, so that is gonna be just a fantastic amenity uh, for the residents here on that county park that's on the way. Greenway dedication, we mentioned amenities throughout uh, and commitments to heightened architectural standards. Uh, I think we're short on time. I have the rest of our development team on if you have questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Um, I do have um, one uh, question um, uh, for the petitioner and for staff. I see that we do have um, five-year vested rights. I understand that this is a large area um, to be developed, but it seems like a pretty straightforward de development. Um, to the petitioner and to staff, um, well, petitioner, why is, what is the need for vested rights and staff? Is, is this something that, that meets our standards? Yeah, I, I thought about that at the conversation you had earlier this evening. Uh, we think this is an example of one that can, you know, th this is over 500 units. It will take several years for this to develop out. Uh, we, have, we are committing to a conditional plan with certain improvements. So what we don't want is to get two years in, have new changes in ordinance, and then we cannot build out the design we have here. Uh, so I certainly think it's appropriate. Uh, hope staff will, but I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves. Thank you. Yeah, we haven't made a straightforward request to have it removed at this point. I think we'd still like to learn a little bit more about some of the timing, uh, but it does seem like a, a project with multiple phases over a, a pretty long build out time frame might warrant that, uh, particularly with some pending changes and, and adoptions and some ordinances for us. But uh, yeah, we'll wait to talk to them, learn a little bit more and then uh, make a request accordingly if we need to see any adjustments to it. Thank you very much. Uh, Council members, uh, is there any uh, questions or comments? Mr. Phipps? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, 
congratulate the petitioner on his patience. And I know this project uh, uh, went through many hurdles and, and uh, land assemblage of, of acreage to get to this point. Uh, the property lies adjacent to the uh, high-speed rail, eventual high-speed rail project that would run from, uh, I guess, Atlanta to points north. But uh, this represents a, a huge uh, uh, um, uh, location of a lot of, uh, of, of residences uh, for people that uh, might be interested in uh, home ownership. So I look forward to that, and hopefully we can get uh, get this over the finish line here at uh, next month. Thanks. Move to close. Second. Um, I'm sorry, I have a question. I texted um, I'm Donata. I'm having, I don't know. I don't know how to raise my hand on yeah. this laptop. <laughs> we have properly motioned, but uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, you have a chance to question and comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Dave about the vested rights. Uh, we we did have the discussion earlier, and um, you know we were told that this is kind of few and far between. Yet here we are again. So I wanted to know what what that would include vested rights. Um, We were in a transitional stage, you know, in the city, and we're adopting new policies and UDO and, uh, I mean, in the 2040 plan. So what would, what rights would be protected uh, with these five-year vested rights? And then secondly, while he's, because I can't hear him, I don't know yep. if he's. We're, we're trying to get the right answer for you, but go ahead, Ms. Johnson. And then secondly, I wanted to confirm that these are for sale units. Are we, can we confirm that these are for sale or um, for, for sale single family homes? These, these do not have a for sale only restriction. They're being platted. What you've seen a lot in the market lately and we've seen is uh, a new uh, single family for rent, which are typically not platted on individual lots. Um, so with this rezoning, these are all individually platted with the fee going with them. Um, I don't know that we've, that I'm familiar with a single or for sale restriction on those. Uh, and I know that's something we talked with the development team and you about. Uh, I don't know if that's developed further. If uh, Mike Fess is on and has a better answer, let me know. But uh, we can see from our plan that these are platted uh, as individual lots. Okay. So they're individual lots, but there's no uh, nothing in the in the plan and the petition that restricts them to for sale. Yeah. So this doesn't look like a lot of the single family for rent that we're seeing are platted. You know, you, you can tell by looking at them that that's what they're intended to do. This does get into a little bit of concern about restrictions on alienation. So if we if, if you you sell a single family home to a buyer and that person buys it, then there's a concern of restricting them from renting their single family home in the future. Typically, that is handled through um, lenders, which will have an overall cap on how many can be rented. But this is this is being platted as a typical single family home development. Thank you. Ms. Hagel Gray? Yeah. Uh, Council Member Johnson, uh, with respect to vested rights, the simplest way I can um, answer is that um, once a plan is approved, sp specifically a CD plan that has site specific conditions, once that is approved, um, statutorily, the development is protected. Um, and may develop under what was approved for two years, even if there's a change to the ordinances that apply. And then um, if the council chooses to extend that to five years, then the developer is protected and may complete the plan as approved, even if there's a change to the applicable ordinances during that period. Okay, thank you. I'll have I'll I'll meet with you or with the city attorney or um, I think we need to really know how how that yeah. will impact you know the, the city um, because this is the second time I we, we've seen it tonight and so if this is going to be it, it may be very prudent but I yes. just I, I'd like more information about it from the uh, city attorney or from 
I'll sense. give an example of why that's important in this case. If you see this development, and maybe you're not seeing my screen, but there's a there are two connections in and out of this development, one to Caldwell Park, and then another, if you see to the south, a road snakes across a creek there. We have a few homes and it connects to a neighborhood. It was very, very important to the city staff that we have two ways in and out of this neighborhood. And so as this, we've committed to that, this plan, we're building based on our regulations under our current ordinance. And in this case, we know we can build that. It's possible that if this rezoning is approved, we've committed to two ways in and out. It is possible that we have new ordinances that restrict how we can cross that creek in the future. And let's say two years expire, but we don't have an additional year. It, it might, you can conceive where the new regulations would no longer allow us to cross the creek. However, we have a zoning plan that requires the connection across the creek. And that's the challenge that we get into when we approve a conditional plan and are then not allowed enough time to develop under those. So that, that's just an example of showing you the quandary that we could be in that pops out to me by looking at this. But so thank you and happy to discuss further. Okay, and I and I understand that, but I'm, we are in a transitional period in the city. And um, the fact that I'm seeing two of these tonight, I don't recall seeing these, you know, this many in the whole time we were on, I've been on council. So, and, and so I just want to make sure that that, that we uh, understand and, and are doing what's best for the residents because when ordinances, ordinances are changed, they're changed for a reason. So I, I just want some more information on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And I do think you bring up a good, good point. Um, we, we don't pass many uh, that have vested rights. They, we are asked at times and they usually get taken away. Uh, but Ms. Craig and, and Mr. Petten, uh, I think we should take a note of, of the vested rights issue. Um, um, even after we get out this transition time, um, after we pass the UDO, we, we have made it very clear um, that all of our, our planning process are living documents. Uh, so that says that there is real possibilities for things to change. Um, um, quickly or in the methodical fashion that is being laid out um, on a one to five year basis. Um, so I think we do need to deal with the policy issue of, of, um, of vested rights, especially given that future context, um, because we don't want uh, this to be an, an issue that um, holds things up or that we have to deal with on every single petition. So. Um, with not hearing or seeing any more uh, desire for questions or comments, I will make a motion to close. The we have one already. Oh, yes, we do. You're right. Properly uh, made and seconded. Um, I am I'm a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Uh, Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Uh, Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. We will move on to item number 30, um, rezoning petition 2021-168 by Station West LLC, which is approximately 3.83 acres located on the southeastern corner of the intersection of Berry Hill Road and State Street in Council District Three, Miss Watlington's district. Current zoning is I-2 general industrial and the proposed zoning is MUD O mixed use development optional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to land use. Um, again, we have no speakers against. So after Mr. Petten's presentation, uh, Mr. Murray, you'll have three minutes. Thank you, 2021-168, uh, it's 3.8 acres on Berry Hill Road uh, with the intersection of State Street. Uh, it's currently zoned I-2 uh, and the proposed zoning is MUD optional. The adopted future land use from the Central District Plan does recommend industrial land uses for this site and the general surrounding area. Uh, the proposal itself is to allow all uses permitted in the MUD district with the exception of things like adult, active adult retirement communities, adult establishments, 
auction sales, auction houses, automotive service stations, boarding houses, commercial rooming houses, hotels and motels, post office, telephone booths, uh, transit stations uh, are, are part of those lists. Yeah, <laughs> saw that telephone booths is a, a restricted use. Uh, request that following optional provisions for this petition to allow parking and maneuvering areas between the buildings and the Berry Hill Road setback, also to allow modified sidewalk and planning strip width configuration along Berry Hill Road as well as State Street due to some existing site conditions. Uh, also utilize the table to calculate cumulative chip gen for the site. Uh, which would be updated and added to the cover sheet of the permitting site for each project within this rezoning area. Uh, when those proposed cumulative trips exceed that 2,500 threshold, we would uh, then be, have them perform a traffic impact study and, pro and or propose some alternative transportation improvements. Uh, in lieu of that TIS, those of course would all be subject to the approval of CDOT. Uh, it also allows for building additions while limiting building height to 40 feet, does provide a minimum of 10,000 square feet of pedestrian plaza or amenitized open space, and states that all new lighting, excluding decorative lighting, would be full cutoff type. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to land use. Uh, as mentioned, it is inconsistent with that industrial land use recommendation, but uh, very much in line with what we've seen uh, with even some recent petitions over the last month or two uh, and ongoing redevelopment in this area and adaptive reuse. Uh, so staff, again, does recommend approval and we'll be happy to take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Petten. Um, David Murray, you have uh, three minutes. Uh, good evening, council members. David Murray, attorney with Odom, uh, with Murray Law Firm, actually now here in Charlotte, uh, representing the petitioner. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Um, I agree with staff's uh, presentation for the Station West rezoning. Uh, this project is an adaptive reuse. So the buildings already exist. Uh, the primary visual change on this site is for the pedestrian plaza. Uh, that is currently under construction. Um, this project is almost already fully built out under um, I-2 zoning, um, but it fits better under a MUD optional uh, zoning. And basically this whole area, other than the asphalt plant adjacent to us, is going to MUD O. Um, the outstanding issues are relatively minor and we should have those resolved shortly. And I'm happy to answer any questions you uh, you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Mr. Phipps. Yeah, uh, Mr. Murray. So, um, so is this a phased adoptive reuse project? Uh, no. This is. If you go out there today, uh, most of the uses that we're going to have on this site already exist. There's already a coffee shop. Um, there's some office space for uh, real estate uh, construction. Uh, there's a, a dessert restaurant. Basically, the issue is under I-2, I-2 zoning wasn't really ever envisioned for a mixed use type development, although it allows it. And so it makes it difficult when you're doing different parking calculations or square footage calculations. So under MUD, everybody's counted the same. All the uses are counted the same. And so it makes it a little bit easier when you have tenants going in and out. Let's say you have a, an office space that switches over to a dessert shop. Those are the, those are the same under MUD, whereas under I-2, uh, the design standards might be different. And so that's the purpose of doing the MUD optional. But as we sit here today, you could actually go out there and get a cup of coffee at the coffee shop that uh, is going to remain there after this rezoning or any of the uses that are there uh, will, will remain after the rezoning. So for a visual, visual perspective, not much is actually really going to change, but the uses are much more in line with a mud use as opposed to an uh, industrial uh, zoning. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I want to continue. Um, so the, the, our staff analysis makes mention of a cumulative uh, table that will be used to calculate trip generation. And uh, because this doesn't require a traffic impact study right now, 
but it could in the future. So I'm trying to figure out how does a post-traffic impact study, assuming that this is approved, how does this work? I guess that's a question for uh, CDOT, uh, Mr. Patton. Um, I'm trying to figure out how, how do you make the petitioner to be bound by the results of a traffic impact study that's done after approval of the petition? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so essentially, we wanted to put that development table in there so that we're not exposed because under the mud you know, it can trigger a lot more aggressive uses that'll trigger a ton of trips. So with what they're, they currently have permitted, that's that 1,895 trips with the uses that are there today. So that doesn't trigger the traffic study. However, if they update those uses and they modify that space and need to come in for permitting, that's whenever we're able to then have them give us the trip gen updated and then we can trigger a traffic study if it's needed. So whenever they're coming through the permitting phase, which typically under MUDO, we can't require a traffic study right now uh, with a buy right permit, but having this conditional note with this rezoning, it kind of leaves us less exposed with that. And we're, uh, Council Member Phipps, we're also limiting a lot of the intensive uses and this, because the intention here is to be, you know, small, uh, office space, kind of flex office space with some, you know, coffee shops, some some of those type uh, um, uh, uses. Um, but I think, like CDOT said, really it would come in through permit process if the whole thing was to change over. Um, but that's not that's not the intent is for all these uses to change over. I just have a follow up um, to that. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Phipps. Um, but once the trips are being generated because of the use of, of that parcel, the, 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 the trips are being generated. So um, you, you can't put the, you know, you can't put the genie back in a bottle. So what was, would be the point of that traffic study? And, and what would the clawback be um, if it would go over a certain amount? Um, so, yeah, with this area being as densely developed and urbanized as it is, um, that's why we also put that language in that note or alternative transportation improvement. So um, if we didn't end up requiring the traffic study, we, we say a traffic study, it might be more of like a multimodal analysis where we can make sure that we're getting bicyclists and pedestrians to and from uh, bus stops or the greenway that's going in next to Savona Mills or the gold line, uh, things of that nature. I guess what I'm saying, what would what, what be our leverage to ensure that whatever improvements need to be, be made will be actually made? Because once this rezoning goes through and the, uh, the, the development is, is, is done and those trips are generated, I've, I've heard mention of the permitting process, but what, what does that actually mean? So there's a, a table that they're going to include on their plans. And with that table, it'll say essentially what they were permitted with based on uh, the land use and the intensity. And then whenever they come in for the permit set, you know, if they change the space, then they'll have to say what the new land use and intensity is, and that'll have a trips associated with it. So whenever that delta is increased by that 2,500, that's whenever we would trigger them doing the traffic study. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think part of the, the challenge with these areas uh, is a lot of the projects that we're seeing, even in the rezoning process, I think we had one approved last month, one approved earlier this evening, and then we have this one going to hearing, and they're all in that same general area. A lot of them are already in permitting uh, or have gotten permits, and what the holdup is for them is the parking ratio, as Mr. Murray had stated. So part of the, I think, strategy that, that CDOT's working with is to try to kind of understand We've got some uses that are already permitted and in. We don't want to necessarily, you know, penalize them for something that they've already got going on and kind of meet them where they are now, but know long term that, you know, should those intensities continue to creep up and we've got another, you know, 
use coming in or another three or four uses coming in online and those trips start to really go beyond what we're already looking at today and recognize and already issued permits for, then that's when we look at are there multimodal improvements, are there going to be street improvements that we can build off of. Uh, so it's kind of meeting them where they are now but planning for additional adaptive reuse and, and giving ourselves a little bit of that safety valve long term. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from council members? Mr. Yes, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Driggs. Uh, I just want to say I, I haven't actually heard the answer to the question yet. Uh, if at a future time it turns out that the traffic study is triggered, is, do we have any power to act on the findings of the traffic study and limit what happens? Can we use the permitting process, for example, to, to uh, constrain what happens? Or is, is, uh, are we just making observations? I mean, some of the other things you talked about are things that we might do, but what control do we have over what development takes place there as the result of a traffic study that's done later? So we would have the permitting process, correct. Yeah, we would have the permitting process to fall back on in those situations. That's exactly why we've geared the note to that process, because we know we're not going to capture it right now. We've got that option to handle it in the permitting process, similar to what we do with TOD by right projects. If they trigger that threshold under a TOD zoning district, then we move forward at that point in permitting with a traffic study. And that project kind of sits until those improvements are identified and made and committed to, uh, and then permits are issued then to move forward with construction. So we do have that as, as the alternative to doing it now. The note that's captured in this rezoning would allow it to then happen in the permitting process. So we could deny a permit if the outcome of the traffic study uh, is not what we intended. Is that right? Yeah, we, the permit wouldn't get issued until the study was approved and those improvements incorporated into the project accordingly. So, Mr. Winston, I think that's the answer. Yeah, uh, and I, I apologize we didn't get <laughs> we took that long to get to that 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 answer, but that that is correct. The permitting process would be used in that instance. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, is that, were you um, uh, asking to be recognized? I was, thank you. So this ties into what, what, what I was talking about, cumulative effects. So, and I appreciate CDOT's strategy or, or proactive approach in looking at this, but they're looking at the cumulative impact of the the permits of the development just in this petition. So is, is there a way, there seems, and we should talk about this on, offline, but this is what our, our voters can, can hear us talk about and, and, and ask your council members to make changes to the, to the policies. So we know that this is 18, 20, 1,825 trips. And it will. It may possibly go over 25, uh, 2,500 trips, which triggers the traffic in, um, the traffic study. So, is it possible that because we know that this is a possibility, we should look at maybe certain types of developments or, or really incorporate this process and and replicate it? There's there's just something there that what Brandon is doing. And, and being strategic in this petition, we need to replicate this for our policies. So why wait until it goes through permitting? Permitting. I know what. Can we look at the? Can we can we get a report on all of the developments surrounding this petition within within two miles in the past two years? Because. Um, can we have that report as a follow-up, um, Mr. Petton? Because we know this is a large petition. This is probably going to be larger, as, as you suspect. So why don't we, as council members, take a, a, a cumulative look at this area? Yeah. And then that can, can we have that as a follow-up along with the other one that I asked about? Um, yeah, we we um, we uh, uh, got the cumulative one on um, 
the, traf uh, the trip generation uh, in District 7. And I'm looking at staff. We think we can work on something for Ms. Johnson, getting the affirmative. Um, again, I think this is a good policy question that was brought up by Mr. Phipps um, in terms of um, I, I don't think I've ever seen this table, or I, I don't remember dealing with the table like this, um, but as, as it relates to traffic generation and, and, and future improvements, I, again, I don't know if this is something that we're dealing with in the UDO um, in, in implementation, um, but it seems like a loophole, poten potential loophole situation. Um, uh, I'd love to, I guess, get a follow-up on that at some point in time during the UDO process. And, and and cumulative approach is something I've been saying for a long time. So what it looks like in this petition, there's a cumulative table specifically for this petition. So we know that it's possible or we're, or we're on the fringes of it. So what I would say is uh, whatever this approach is, if we can look at this and, and not just looking at the cumulative trips from within this petition, because that's what this says. Can we take that tool and use it for the cumulative impact on, throughout the whole area? Yes, ma'am. Because we need to change. And, and I guess I would ask also, Mr. Petten, so right now the policy is that a, one development must trigger 2,500 trips in order for them to be required to do a traffic study. Is that state law is, or is that city policy? It's city policy. Well, I, I think we can uh, definitely uh, glean from that list uh, that you requested, uh, Ms. Johnson. I, I would also say um, I pay attention to uh, the uh, zoning commissioner's notes. Um, there's always, well, there is often um, concern about the mud districts by certain planning commissioners and, and, and their uses and the inability um, to regulate um, certain parts of the use, in, in, including uh, trip generation. So again, I think this is something that we should certainly um, pay attention to in, in the UDO um, and implementation of, of new zoning districts. Ms. Johnson, do you, do you, um, were you complete or did you want to? Um, well, yeah, I just, I mean, I just, I. I this is, this is such a huge issue to me. Um, even with the one example that I had in my district, uh, whatever, last month or the month before, the uh, petition itself didn't trigger a, a traffic study, but when we did a cumulative report, there were like 10,000 trips. So, I mean, I think this is just a way for us to manage the growth. And I just, uh, again, I think this is something that we, we we, we hear now, we know now it's a city policy. It's in our jurisdiction, the 11 of us. You know, like I've heard you say, Mr. Braxton, Mr. Winston before, you know, help is not coming, it's us. The, the buck stops here. So I just think that this is something that I hope we can really take a look at, um, the a cumulative approach in managing um, development in the city, a cumulative approach to the traffic information study requirements and then that way then perhaps there will be more improvements um, uh, required from the development developers to the infrastructure so I don't you know that's if, if, if somehow the staff can take a look at how that policy would look um, if there's going to be you know you know how that's how that's going to work but we just really have to do something our our, our, our residents we hear this constantly, but every zoning meeting, it's like we put our head in the sand and and and, and have to approve these or because of the current policies. So, again, I just I, I can't say it enough. Thank yeah, you. Yes, uh, we we well, you're, you're right. We definitely don't have to. We can we can all choose. It's our prerogative, the eleven of us, to vote. Um, how we wish, um, and I think you brought up some good points, and I think we have t taken some notes in here uh, to follow up um, from a policy perspective uh, so we can apply those policies uh, to our land use decisions um, and, 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 and through those lenses to, to make those affirmative or denial uh, votes. Um, Mr. Phipps would like to be recognized for another question or comment. Yeah, I guess I take a contrarian view on this particular petition when it as it relates to uh, the cumulative effect because in my mind, this 
this effect, uh, this petitioner recognizes that within his project, he has the potential to reach 2,500 trips. So this is not like looking at ancillary petitions around, unrelated, you know, apart from this. It's just, I mean, I don't see it as looking at it from a cumulative impact in that regard. I just think that this is within this development. He's already at 1895 or something, but he recognizes that within his project that it could go up to 250, uh, not taking into consideration on, on a related uh, ancillary petitions or, or growth that might be surrounding his particular project. Motion close. Second. Um, think, uh, Mr. I mean, Mr. Winston, yes. if all council members can turn on their cameras before voting, you have to have your cameras on to vote. Thank you. Yes, uh, again, uh, just again, to comply with state law, um, to count your affirmative vote, we need your camera on for you to say yes. Um, so please um, keep a camera on. And if you are gonna turn your camera off, just let me or um, Donata know. Thank you. So I'm a, uh, I'm a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. We'll move along to item number 31, uh, a rezoning petition 2021-195 by Steel Creek 1997 LLC, which is approximately 60.65 acres located in the northeastern quadrant of the interchange of Interstate 485 and Arrowwood Ro Road in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's district. The current zoning is Mud O Air Mixed Use Development Optional Airport Noise Overlay, and the proposed zoning is Mud O Air SPA Mixed, uh, uh, mixed Development Optional Airport, airport Noise Overlay Site Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation um, is approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to land use uh, and the environment. Uh, we have no speakers uh, against, uh, so the petitioner will have three minutes after Mr. Petten's presentation. Thank you. 2021-195 is 60.65 acres, just located on West Arrowwood Road, uh, in the northeastern quadrant of the interchange with I-485. Current zoning is Mudo Air. Uh, that's the airport noise overlay. Uh, and then the proposed zoning is for Mudo Air site plan amendment as well as I-1 conditional, uh, all maintaining that airport noise overlay. Steel Creek Area Plan adopted in 2012 recommends mixed use residential office retail land uses for the site. That was amended by rezoning petition 2018 121, which uh, initially established the mix of uses on this site and the plan that's being proposed for amendment this evening. Uh, previously approved site plan for this petition or for this property, excuse me, was petition 2018 121. That was a total of 264.93 acres. That broke things into two zoning districts, I-1 conditional and MUD-O, both with airport noise overlay. Uh, the MUD-O portion uh, was labeled as development area E. That's what's being considered this evening for a site plan amendment. That would request to rezone that development area E to an I-1 conditional with up to 25,000 square feet of office, repair, maintenance, warehouse, showroom assembly, and sales uses. I would also allow for an additional 10,000 square feet of commercial uses that would bring the total to 83,000 square feet of those uses and they would be in development areas A and B. Uh, this pro proposal also would request uh, an additional 150 residential dwelling units that would then bring the total up to 420 uh, in development area C. Uh, as mentioned, staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to land use and the environment. Uh, it is consistent with the mixed residential office retail uses for the site, but inconsistent for that uh, area that's proposed to be industrial. Uh, there was an original traffic study performed on this petition back in 2018 that was updated and amended uh, as part of this petition to capture some of those new uses and additional square footage. So uh, we did make sure we uh, were on top of any of those changes for this particular petition. Uh, and with that, I'll be happy to take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are five people to speak for three minutes, but I believe either Mr. Jeff Brown or Bridget Grant um, would um, be
be collaborating on that. Ms. Grant? Yes, that's me. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good evening, members of council, members of the Zoning Committee. Again, Bridget Grant, Land Use Consultant with Moran Van Allen. Pleased to be here tonight with my colleague Jeff Brown, as well as representing Chris Thomas with Children's Klein, Randy Goddard, our traffic engineer, and Sean Tooley with Land Design. As always, and I apologize, I'm not able to advance the slides. Let me see. Oh, well, Dave did a great job on his presentation. And as he mentioned, we're requesting a site plan amendment for a portion of the site that was approved in 2018. Um, if I were able to get my slides to advance, I would show you that work has already commenced on the slide on the site. Wendy, are you able to advance the slides to my colored site plan, please? You oh, have there, we there we go. The, you can see that the site work has already begun on the site. This is the 2018-121 site plan that shows that the site was proposed for that mix of uses. And our changes are limited to this area right in here. It's the yellow area that's highlighted showing where we're going to add that additional 150 multifamily units, the additional 10,000 square feet of office and the 25,000 square feet of additional office assembly sales and light industrial type uses. Um, as Dave mentioned, we did do a traffic study to confirm that additional improvements were not needed. The plan is largely consistent with the adopted the newly adopted 2040 policy plan. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Um, if nobody else from Ms. Grant's team would like to use their three minutes, we can turn it over to council questions or comments. Mr. Phipps, you're recognized. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> how, many, how many drive through facilities are proposed for this uh, particular project? Uh, Mr. Phipps, I, the, there are no drive throughs proposed as part of this site plan amendment. Oh, okay. So I thought I read, I, I read somewhere where maybe these other drive throughs are proposed in other development areas of the project. On the previous rezoning, the zonings were not changing. There are drive throughs permitted in some of the other development areas, but we're not changing, um, we're not requesting any more. Thank you. Mr. Driggs, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Winston. I'm, I'm just interested, we're talking about additional units as a result of the change. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm not seeing it here, but do we have how many units there are in total or, or, or what the original position was and the change and therefore what the new situation will be? Yeah, we had an additional 150 residential dwellings uh, that brought the total up to 420 units. Uh, Ms. Grant, is that correct? It's correct. Okay. Thank you. Right, plus, plus the additional office space. And was there office space there before? There was. We increased it by 10,000 up to 83. So we were at 73,000 the first on the first petition. So could I just ask offline, could I get the comparison, please? Just let us know what this looks like uh, after we approve this instead of just the increment. Thank you. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. Um, I don't see any more hands raised of uh, council questions or comments. Move to vote. Second. Uh, we have a motion that's made and properly second. I'm a yes. Mr. Bokari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Ms. Ashmira. Yes. Mr. Phipps. Yes. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item uh, number 32, um, rezoning petition 2021-204 by William J. Walkoff. Approximately 6.85 acres located at the southeast intersection of West W.T. Harris Boulevard and Hendry Road, west of Old Statesville Road in Council District 2, Mr. Graham's district. The current zoning is I-2, General Industrial, and the proposed zoning is I-1, Light Industrial Conditional. Staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation uh, and site design. Uh, we do not have anybody speaking against. 
Um, so the petitioner uh, will have three minutes, and I have Sean Cauldron and William Walkoff. Um, I believe they're both virtual. Mr. Walkoff or Mr. Cauldron, are they up? Okay. Hello? Yes, sir. How are you doing? Is, uh, uh, Sean is supposed to be speaking on behalf of the project. I was only here to answer any questions that uh, you guys might have in regards to the project. So he should be here. Sean, are you available? I'm here. There we go. Have we heard the staff on this one? Oh, yes. I'm, you're absolutely right, Mr. Driggs. Um, after the staff's presentation, Mr. Walkoff, Mr. Coulter. Let's go, Mr. Winston. <laughs> Just a sound order, check. Mr. Just doing a sound check. You're out of order, Mr. Bakari. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Patton. All right. 2021-204 uh, is 6.85 acres on Hendry uh, Road just off of uh, Harris Boulevard. It's currently zoned, as mentioned, I-2, and the proposed zoning is for I-1 conditional. Uh, the adopted future land use uh, North Lake area plan does recommend industrial warehouse and distribution land uses at this site. Uh, so this petition request would be consistent with that. Uh, the petition itself is requesting up to 18,000 square foot to showroom building with an outdoor sales lot uh, would allow up to a 13,650 square foot service and repair building limits building height to 40 feet and also provides a greenway and stormwater easement to Mecklenburg County. You can see that in that dotted green line uh, where it says greenway and stormwater easement. Uh, as mentioned, the staff does recommend approval of this petition have some outstanding issues related to transportation and site design to work through. Uh, it is consistent with the North Lake area plan recommendation for industrial uses, uh, and we'll be happy to take any questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pitton. Now, uh, Mr. Walkoff, Mr. Cauldron, you have three minutes. Mr. Cauldron. Sorry, right, thank you. Uh, that, yeah, this is rezoning petition 2021-204. Uh, next slide. Uh, the location of the requested rezoning is on the southeast corner of West W.T. Harris and Hendry Road. Next slide. Uh, the site has an existing building and parking lot, which will remain on site and the rest of the parcel currently is undeveloped, which is where our proposed project will be. Next slide. The current zoning, as previously mentioned, is I-2 general industrial, and all surrounding parcels are also zoned I-2. Next slide. The requested zoning is I-1 conditional, which will allow the use of automotive sales and repairs, including tractor trucks and accompanying trailer units. Uh, the proposed, more specific proposed use of this site is for a new Airstream dealer and service center. And only a portion of the site, as noted in red in the, the image, will be rezoned to I-1. The remaining portion with the existing building will remain I-2. Next slide. And then you can see here, you can't, the, the parcel is not highlighted, but the, the proposed project is is consistent with the North Lake area plan. And I'm available to answer any questions. And I apologize for this slide is actually the, 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 the old site plan. The original site plan that the city staff presented originally was is, is the, the current plan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cauldron. Um, council, uh, do you have any questions or comments for the petitioner or staff? Mr. Phipps, you're recognized. Yes, I was wondering, is it is it your intention to use the entirety of this site as uh, in your project? The C, the, the C1 or whatever? No, the the portion of the property that has an existing building and parking lot will remain as is, and it will remain I-2. The, the remaining portion of the, the, the undeveloped portion of the property will be rezoned to I-1 conditional for our proposed project. Okay, so that entire 
that uh, apart from the building, then this, this other part, this entire site will be used a large portion of it, yes. There will be a, a, a tree save area as required by the ordinance. And as previously mentioned, uh, Mecklenburg County has requested the, the greenway and storm easement along the eastern side. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Newton, you're recognized. My hand wasn't up, uh, Mr. Chair. Move to close. Second. We have a, a, motion, a motion is probably second. Uh, Ms. Jackson, do we have anybody else that's um, okay? We will begin the roll call vote. I am a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Uh, Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. We will move on to item number. Mr. Winston, if we could just, I'm not sure if everyone had their camera on for that vote. Could we just? Okay, we will do, can we'll, we, can we, do just, we will do the roll call vote again. Um, please, uh, if you are going to vote, leave your camera on. Um, if you are going to turn your camera off, um, please let me or Ms. Jackson know um, and do not vote. Thank you. Um, but we have a motion that's made and properly second. I'm a yes. Mr. Bakari? Sir, yes. Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and we will move on to agenda item number 33, um, rezoning petition 2021-207 by Monifa Hendrickson Woodside, approximately 3.7 acres located on the southeastern corner of the intersection of Independence Boulevard and Paul Buck Boulevard in Council District 1, Mr. Eggleston's district. Current zoning is B2 general business and the proposed zoning is MUD O mixed use development optional. Staff recommendation is approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to site and building design. I do not have any speakers for or against. Uh, so uh, Mr. Petten, uh, you have the staff presentation and then we'll go into council questions and comments. Okay, thank you. Um, just for another matter of housekeeping on this one, we did have uh, Ms. Hendrickson as the listed applicant or petitioner on this. It's actually a, a petition uh, by the Charlotte Regional Visitor Authority, and let me just confirm that. Uh, so it would be a petition for CRVA. We'll update that on materials on our end, but just wanted to note that for the minutes. Uh, but the petition itself, 2021-207, uh, it's about 3.7 acres located on the southeastern corner of the intersection of Independence Boulevard and Paul Buck, as mentioned. Uh, most of us know this is Ovens Auditorium. Uh, the existing zoning is B2. Proposed zoning would be MUD optional. Uh, and the adoptive future land use does recommend institutional uses, which would be basically the city-owned properties there around uh, Ovens and Bojangles Coliseum. The proposal with this petition is really to just add on-site signage that would exceed the ordinance standards. Uh, the existing building and all the site conditions are to remain. Essentially, all that we would see is the addition of a new monument sign up there at the front on Independence Boulevard outlined in red and yellow, uh, and then additions of two new pole signs as noted on the site plan, one towards that back end of the parking lot and then one in the middle uh, right as you're walking towards uh, the auditorium. And the monument sign in front of ovens along Independence would be a total area of 450 square feet per side and up to 20 feet in height. A uh, two-side electronic sign would be integrated into it, measuring 275 square feet per side, so essentially just an update to the technology and a little bit of a larger size for the sign itself. Uh, the pole signs uh, would be a total of 30 square feet per side and up to 10 feet in height. They would each have a two-sided electronic sign integrated to it, uh, measuring 29 square feet per side. The optional provisions would be for an exemption from uh, the building and site requirements that would conflict with the as-built conditions as they relate to mud. Uh, that would also be for parking and loading standards and screening. 
uh, and it does commit to obtaining a permit from NCDOT outdoor advertising unit prior to construction as Independence uh, is an NCDOT maintained road. Uh, so again, essentially this is an upgrade to the existing sign. We all are probably familiar with the existing marquee along Independence. Uh, this would take that to a, a new updated electronic sign along with those pole signs that are uh, provided for additional information, wayfinding, other things for um, sites or for activities that are going on on the site as well as future activities. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. Uh, just some outstanding issues related to site and building design to work through. It is consistent with those institutional land use recommendations per the Independence Boulevard Area Plan, uh, and we'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Madam Clerk, do we have anybody to speak for? It? Thank you very much. Um, are there any uh, questions? Or yeah, Mr. Winston, I got my hand up. Okay, Mr. Eggleston, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, there's not a speaker, so I don't know who I'm telling this to, but um, I'll some, hopefully we'll get back to it. We, we do back. have, um, uh, Madam Clerk, we do seem to have somebody that could speak on the behalf of the I petition. I, I don't know. Well, I, I have to check on. Okay. Well, I, I don't necessarily need a response. I'm, it's more of a comment. Um, I understand the, the desire for and need for more modern signage, electronic signage here. Um, and I think the renderings I've seen look nice. And I, I have heard that there is a commitment for the historic sign that has been there and is so well recognized to be relocated on site. Um, if that commitment to relocating the sign that's there now on site is in the petition. I scanned through and didn't see it, um, but I would like to see that commitment written in the notes of the petition, and I'd like it to include um, relocated to another prominent or visible spot on site. I'd like that sign to be uh, to continue in use in addition to these electronic signs, because I think that's um, one of a handful of things that people maybe most recognize about uh, the Bojangles Coliseum and Ovens Auditorium Complex. So um, I'm comfortable with it if if that note is added and um, that's it. So if there weren't any others, I'll, I'll make the motion to close. Second. Uh, uh, thank you. We have a motion that's properly seconded and uh, staff has, has taken note. I, I would just... Um, uh, Mention Mr. Eggleston, there is somebody in the room um, that uh, is paying, also paying attention to, to, to your question, um, but they have not signed up um, to speak for or against. Um, and I, so I don't believe that we can invite Yeah, them. no response yeah. necessary as long as they captured that. Thank you very much. So um, we have a motion that's made and properly second. I am a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Uh, Mr. Driggs? Yes. Um, Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Ashmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yeah. We will um, move on to item number 34, rezoning petition 2021-209 by Coastal Acquisition Entity, LLC. Approximately 0.99 acres located at the southeastern corner of the intersection of Steel Creek Road and Rigsby Road in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's district. The current zoning is R3 single family residential and the proposed zoning is NS, Neighborhood Services. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. I have no speakers against. This so the petitioner will have three minutes after Mr. Pre Mr. Petten's presentation. All right, thank you. 2021 209, it's just under an acre on Steel Creek Road and Rigsby Road, zoned R3, and proposed zoning is NS Neighborhood Services. Adopted future land use from the Steel Creek area plan does recommend residential up to six dwelling units per acre. Plan also has a recommendation that consideration would be giving to a mixture of residential office and retail uses along Steel Creek Road. 
Uh, we did also perform the Steel Creek Development Response Study in 2017 that evaluated the changing development patterns in the area and did recommend moderate to low intensity mixed use development for this site and the surrounding area. Uh, while it wasn't adopted by city council, it did include the participation of area property owners, residents, as well as city council district reps for the area. As most of us uh, may recall, we did recently approve of a large mixed use development in this area with office, retail, hospital uses, residential, uh, within this general area of Rigsby Road and Steel Creek Road. Uh, this would continue to be part of that ongoing mixed use development, even though this is a standalone project, it does integrate itself into that larger uh, ongoing mixed use development on this side of Steel Creek Road. The proposal itself is for all uses permitted <clears throat> in the NS zoning district. It does propose a 4,000 square foot commercial building with an accessory drive through lane. Access would be from Rigsby Road with a cross access provided to the parcels to the east and south. Uh, commits to construction of a right turn lane on Steel Creek Road at Rigsby. Also requires a drive through queuing analysis for the AM and PKM hours to be submitted to CDOT during that permitting phase. A uh, 12-foot multi-use path along Steel Creek Road, an 8-foot planting strip, and 8-foot sidewalk would be constructed along Rigsby Road. Uh, provides screening of the drive through lane along Steel Creek, which would include a 3-foot uh, wall. And architectural standards related to minimum transparency, blank wall limitations, and a minimum building height of 20 feet are incorporated into the project. Uh, it does indicate that all lighting would be full cutoff, uh, excluding landscape and decorative lighting on the site. As mentioned, staff does recommend approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. Uh, while it is inconsistent with that Steel Creek area plan initial recommendation for residential uh, with the ongoing redevelopment and the development response study, staff did feel like this was a, uh, a ra reasonable transition to make from that residential land use recommendation that was initially adopted. So I'd be happy to take any questions uh, following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Um, Richard Rose, uh, you have three minutes. Uh, Council Member Winston, it's David Murray. Uh, I think I was signed up on this one. Um, I'm a, again an attorney at Murray Law Firm here in Charlotte representing the petitioner. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, I agree with staff's presentation for this rezoning. Uh, this is going to be primarily for a Dunkin' Donuts location. Um, the project's in line with other recent development that's taken place near the outlets. Um, during our uh, site plan revision meeting uh, with NCDOT and CDOT, we were, we were advised um, that the residential properties around us uh, may be uh, included in a, uh, a upcoming uh, rezoning uh, and so when we revised our site plan, we were requested to make a connection that appears to dead end to, end to a residential house, but uh, that is because of the idea of a future uh, development for, um, for probably NS related um, that will be coming uh, apparently pretty soon. Uh, we've also been working with the gas station owner that's zoned NS uh, next door to us uh, to build a new connection uh, to the gas station location. So the idea here is, although we're at a corner, there will be connectivity to the other developments that are around us. There is NS uh, to the south. As you're looking at the residential right now, all the property zoned to the south of, of the residential is already zoned NS. So NS zoning is all around this area. Uh, we have uh, put in improvements uh, to add a turn lane uh, and been talking with NCDOT because there's a major DOT project that's going to take place on Steel Creek Road in this area also, so we've been coordinating with them. Um, the outstanding issues are relatively minor, uh, and so we uh, should have those all resolved, uh, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, council, uh, do you have any questions or comments? Mr. Phipps, you are recognized. Yeah, I had a question for staff. Uh, <clears throat> I know back when the Steel Creek plan was uh, developed back in 2012, I think. Uh, I was on the planning commission then, worked long and hard on it. But, but this uh, Steel Creek development response study, 
Has this uh, essentially replaced the 2012 Steel Creek area plan? Or so, is it just specific to this particular uh, petition? It, it didn't replace the area plan as it wasn't formally adopted by council, but it was uh, an effort that was done, as mentioned, with uh, area property owners and residents in the city council district rep. It was essentially a study of this general area on Steel Creek Road and 485 uh, around the outlets. Once those came online, uh, I think folks knew that was going to lead to some pretty significant land use changes. And so the planning department, uh, along with those area residents and property owners and business owners, worked uh, with the district rep to do a development response that did provide us some additional uh, guidance for land use, but again, it wasn't formally adopted, so we can't base our rationale off of it, but we certainly can use it as a, a little bit of a, a guide for us to understand what some of those anticipated changes were in this area. Thank you, Mr. Phipps. Um, if there are no more uh, questions or comments. Second. We have a motion that's properly made and seconded. Um, we'll start with the roll call vote. I'm a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. We will move on to item number 35, rezoning petition 2021-219 by Lincoln Property Company. The loca lo location is approximately 2.65 acres located on the south side of Kenilworth Avenue, west side of Harding Place, and east side of East Moorhead Street in Council District 1, Mr. Eggleston's district. The current zoning is MUD O PED, a mixed use development, optional site plan amendment, pedestrian overlay. And the proposed zoning is MUD O S P A PED, mixed use development, optional site plan am amendment, pedestrian overlay. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to land use. This petition uh, does have opposition. Um, so after uh, Mr. Petten's uh, presentation, uh, the petitioner will have 10 minutes. All right, thank you. 2021 219, it's 2.65 acres at Moorhead and Kenilworth and Harding Place. Currently zoned Mud O, uh, pedestrian overlay, uh, and the proposed zoning is for Mud O uh, site plan amendment, uh, pedestrian overlay as well. Midtown Moorhead Cherry Area Plan from 2012 does recommend residential office and retail uses for this site. Uh, the proposal itself uh, is essentially a site plan amendment to increase the number of allowed dwelling units from 380 to 388. That would just be a density increase from the 143 to 147 units per acre. Uh, the main change is really to uh, some of the plan notes that would allow for that ground floor commercial space to have the option to be converted into those residential units uh, totaling no more than eight. Uh, and so that is a provision that we see in quite a few more recent site plans where we do have conversion rights uh, and other requests to possibly take some of that non-residential square footage and convert it to residential units at, at a certain ratio. Uh, this petition back when it was approved, I think in 2014, uh, did not include that. Uh, and so this site plan amendment, like I said, is to come back and add a conditional note to still provide the option to take those uh, ground floor retail spaces uh, and convert those, like I said, into uh, no more than eight additional uh, residential units. Uh, as mentioned, staff does recommend approval of this petition. We do have some outstanding issues related to land use to work through, uh, but it is consistent with that Midtown Moorhead Cherry Area Plan recommendation, uh, and we'll be happy to take questions uh, following both presentation by the petitioner and members of the community. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, we have three speakers um, in favor, um, Brittany Lynn, Colin Brown, and Richard Rose. Uh, Mr. Brown, um, I, I believe it's your time. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Councilmember Wesson. Colin Brown, uh, on behalf of the petitioner, um, Dave gave a good overview. Um, some of you may recall, I think back in 2015 or so, uh, my team handled the original rezoning uh, of this property. At that time, there were a couple of interesting things going on in the area. 
Um, here's the site with the star on it. So you may recall directly diagonal uh, to this site where now uh, there's a Twilliger Pappas apartment building. Prior to that, there had been a proposed rezoning on that corner for a Walgreens with a drive-through. Uh, council denied that petition and that site developed as apartments. Um, that was kind of timing it with our development that you're looking at here with the star. And so some of the thinking as we were going through that process is, gosh, this site might be a good location for that Walgreens um, that wanted to go over there. So as we went through the rezoning process, uh, worked with the Dilworth uh, Community Association, community stakeholders, and one of the commitments of that rezoning is this corner that you're looking at um, would be, I think, 14 to 15,000 square feet of retail space. Uh, that is how it was approved. That is how it was built. Uh, so you're, you're looking at now as a photo uh, of the corner. It's going to look very similar to the rezoning plan that was proposed. Uh, the issue, of course, is this space was built out uh, for retail or office tenants. Um, and here we are, you know, almost eight years later, and the space is still vacant. Um, it has been on the market. Um, there has not been a tenant with interest that is a good fit for the building. And so I think uh, Lincoln Properties Desire, who manages the building, as you know, uh, there is great demand in Charlotte for housing. This is a phenomenal neighborhood. Uh, so folks are beating down the door for places to live, but not necessarily uh, places to have office or retail uses. So as Dave mentioned, this is the current site plan. You can see that corner there on the bottom left. It is actually uh, allowed to accommodate a drive-through. Uh, if a drive-through uh, for a financial institution or a pharmacy. Uh, so even that, that drive-through use is, we have not been able to fill the space. Um, and so this request um, is pretty simple. I, I know we've got opposition and, and we'll hear from them, but it is very simply, this space right now, uh, this 14,000 square feet can only be office or retail uses. The zoning proposal essentially to, to change one note and allow it to be or residential uses. Um, and by our count, it looks like about eight residential units could, could be put in that location. And so the development team would like to have the flexibility uh, to do that. Uh, there is, uh, there are, are still working to market the space for commercial uses. It has been built out that way. Uh, makes sense. A commercial user would be preferable. But if no one comes, uh, we'd like the uh, ability to put something in there. The last thing the development team wants is to continue to have a dead kind of vacant corner. And so this would just give the optionality um, to convert that space into residential uses. We're not giving it up or saying uh, commercial uses could never go there, but we could do um, residential uses instead. So again, very, I think, simple request. I know there's opposition, so I'll let us hear from um, the other speakers and then we'll, uh, we'll follow up. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Brown. Um, we do have four speakers um, against. Catherine Allen, Jackie West, Kurt Sowers, and Bob Penny. Um, you all have 10 minutes in total, so how you split it up, um, I, we always just ask to be respective of um, your fellow citizens' request to speak. Um, we will start um, with uh, Catherine Allen, and I will um, update you if, if we start to get low on time. Is Ms. Allen on the line? Yes. yes. Thank you. Hi. Can you see me? We can hear you. We can't see. But you okay. Can, there you go. Hi. Um, I am Catherine Allen, and I have lived in the Dilworth neighborhood and specifically on Harding Place for about um, three years now since I've moved to Charlotte, and I love this neighborhood. So I have lived actually in two different buildings in the neighborhood. So I do want to encourage you that this neighborhood really does need and want retail space. Um, I think there's a huge reason why so many of these apartment complexes are bringing in local food trucks or coffee trucks to please their tenants and to give them quick, convenient options so that they can be in walking distance. So there are four huge apartment buildings in this 
right here on this corner, as well as the hospital, and there's nowhere to go. So there's no grocery store or quick store that we could all use, and that is the only space available. So it would just be so convenient and wonderful to continue to have that space as a retail space. And I think that everyone that I know um, who I've lived in this area with would be all about having a retail space here. And so I just would ask that you would consider um, the tenants. And I think that this opportunity is only a room for growth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Uh, Jackie West, Ms. West, or is Jackie West on the line? She could not be here tonight. All right. All right. Kurt Sowers? Is Kurt yes, Sowers? I'm on the line. Bob Penny. Are you able to hear me? Oh, Kurt, is that you? Yes. All right, thank you very much. How much time do we have, Madam Clerk? Eight minutes and 40 seconds. You have eight minutes and 40 seconds, and you have one other person to speak as well. Go ahead, Mr. Sowers. Okay. All right, thanks for that information, and thanks for letting me speak. I'd like to let you know that I bought the house in 1999, and at the time there were all little cottages, and it was a great neighborhood then, and there's been a lot of positive changes and it's a great neighborhood now. And we can walk on the Greenway and um, I have hundreds of people that are clients of mine that I speak with. So imagine my excitement when we were talking about what might be coming to these big buildings with the inconveniences of our, <clears throat> that we had to live through while they were being built. But that, the excitement of having you know, a brand new neighborhood and things that we could go to out one, the inconveniences of losing our power or internet or having the roads blocked and everything that we lived through with that. So anyway, the people were always positive about a coffee shop or a drugstore, sandwich shop, a restaurant, someplace that we might be able to pick up lunch or pick up something on our way home, um, you know, it would really be an asset to the neighborhood to uh, accommodate something and a drive through drugstore, that would be wonderful. Um, maybe the price is too high, I don't know. But I know the apartments are priced too high and they still rent. <laughs> but anyway, in conclusion, imagine my disappointment when I found out they did wanna put more apartments rather than something that you know, would benefit all of the neighbors that live there. So anyway, Bob, I hope you still have some time to talk. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mrs. Mr. Sowers. Um, Madam Clark, how much time does Mr. Penny have? Six minutes, 53 seconds. Thank you very much, Mr. Penny. You have six minutes and 53 seconds. Right. Well, thank you for allowing me and the other neighborhood representatives to speak tonight regarding this rezoning petition. My name is Bob Penny. My wife and I have for 30 years owned property and run a business adjacent to the land in question. The reason we and our neighbors are here tonight is that we believe the requested rezoning is not in the best interest of the neighborhood and definitely not in the best interest of the city. Uh, first, let me give you some history. Uh, as Colin Brown said, this project spans more than 10 years. And for each of those 10 years, this developer has been at odds with, with our neighborhood. This request follows that same pattern. In 2012, more than 75% of property owners adjacent to this development petitioned the city not to approve the project. Still, the project was approved in December 2013. What happened? Well, in mid-2013, as Mr. Brown said, the community was pushing against this massive 380 unit apartment building. Then the developer announced that they had a drugstore that would occupy much of the first floor of the building. And that was indeed a game changer. The neighborhood became for the first time interested in seeing this massive building put together. But when Colin Brown presented to the city council on December 16th, 2013, the minutes show that he reported that just two days before the plan was due, the prospective tenant had changed his mind and it dropped out. Well, fortunately, Mr. Brown reported the developer still had a different prospective tenant 
and that they could still commit to the same 15,000 square feet of retail space to satisfy the concerns of the neighborhood. And the building was in fact approved that night, December 16th, 2013. It is that 15,000 square feet that the developer committed to that night that they are now asking to be released from. Well, much has happened in the nine years since, since the, that approval. Uh, Mr. Brown, the same attorney who you've heard from tonight, uh, appealed to the adjacent property owners one by one uh, in 2014 that we each allow the developer to install soil nails into our properties, uh, promising that they would do much to speed up the construction process and would not damage our land at all. My wife and I and each of our neighbors ended up cooperating with them in part because we all signed a contract promising that there would be a pre-construction and a post-construction inspection and the developer committed in writing that they would cover the cost of any damage. Well, there, there was not simply some damage, there was extensive damage. In fact, every time we saw dangerous activities going on that the developer was conducting, we would call them and every time the developer would say they would not intervene. When the construction finally ended, we asked for the post-construction assessment that was promised, and their consultants documented more than, in my building alone, more than $100,000 worth of damage that was done by the construction. So what happened, what happened then? Well, the developer's written response was literally, quote, if you don't like it, sue us. We were forced to do so. So four years later, their attorney still will not settle the case. Yet two weeks ago, when I asked to speak to Mr. Rose about the about this petition, he wrote me back that he would talk to me, but Colin Brown had urged him not to do so. Why? Because we have an outstanding lawsuit against them, the one that they refused to settle. But this is the same group now being asked to, re to be released from their promise to provide retail tenants for the neighborhood. That's how they got the building. So the petitioners have, would argue that they are simply requesting, as Mr. Brown has said, expanded uses for their space, that they want commercial, retail, or residential use, use. That is disingenuous. They plan to build eight new apartments and the space they committed would be retail. The petitioner would also argue that they've tried and have been unable to lease it as retail space. That too is disingenuous. One of my tenants, my own tenants, rent 1,700 square feet from me for a salon, went to their leasing agent asking for 3,500 square feet because she could double her space. She was told they would not subdivide. And she also was told that, that the yeah. price, yeah. the raw unaltered square footage price was, 35, was $36 a square foot, which we understand is significantly above market rate. I, my conclusion is they're not really interested in renting this. This was, the, the plan is to turn it into residential apartments. What we're asking is that the petition be put on hold for at least two years. Now that the pandemic is over, conditions for retail have, are changing. If they can't find anyone who's interested in the space, the neighborhood can, we believe the city can. We believe there are lots of options for the retail space. We're not saying they cannot be turned into but the time is not now to abandon that commitment to retail space. We're simply asking the petitioner to be held to the agreement they made to the neighborhood and they made to the city when the city granted them permission to, to, to construct this huge building in 2013. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very uh, much to um, our constituents who have spoken opposition. Mr. Brown, you have two minutes uh, to rebut. Yes, thank you. Um, and that, that was a lot of background color uh, that Dr. Penny has provided. I, I would like to be clear, I am not um, the developer's attorney in the litigation, and I'm not the attorney that advised uh, them not to speak with Mr. Penny. I'm aware of that and that there is ongoing litigation between Dr. Penny and the general contractor on the development. Um, I just reiterate, um, as Mr. Penny stated, in our zoning, we committed to provide 14,000 square feet of commercial space. Uh, that is done. It was built. 
Uh, this is not as if, um, you know, we, we came back a year after the rezoning and tried to change the game. Uh, this building has been there uh, for probably eight years empty. Um, certainly the developer, this is not a devious plan to build this more expensive space in order to get eight more units uh, eight years later. Uh, so I understand that there's some, uh, some ongoing discussions uh, between the parties about some litigation. Uh, and I don't know that that's unreasonable, the request to, to give it a little more time. Um, I'll certainly talk to our clients uh, about that in the intervening period, and um, we will circle back. Happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Eggleston, you're re are recognized for questions and comments. Thank you, sir. Um, my first question is for Mr. Patton. Mr. Patton, we keep using the word retail, but would an office use would be allowable in this space under the previous rezoning language, is that correct? I believe it would, yeah. I can take a quick look again at the site plan, but I do think it, it would allow for uh, retail and office spaces, but I'll confirm and, and get back to you in momentarily. Okay, that, that's my assumption as well, simply based on the fact that um, I live in a neighborhood where we have many of these apartment complexes from the last 10 years where retail was built into the bottom and uh, or retail office was built into the bottom and, and I can say there are still a number of them that have vacant spaces all these years later. So I, I, whether or not the price is too high um, is not for me to determine. I do know that there have been some difficulty in some areas, um, like Plaza Midwood, like Dilworth, in leasing some of these. I guess my question for, and I'll address it to Dr. Penny because he's the person amongst this group of neighbors that I've been communicating with, but most of the ones that I have seen rented in, at least in, in my neck of the woods over here in Plaza Midwood, have ended up being more things along the lines of an architecture firm, a doctor's office or an urgent care, a lawyer's office, um, an interior design firm. Those are the kinds of things that the apartment complexes that are walking distance from where I live have ended up filling those spaces with. And while arguably those are more useful to me as a neighbor than simply having those spaces filled with another neighbor. Um, I guess my question, Dr. Penny, is if, if those ended up being the uses, and again, just anecdotally, they seem like more likely outcomes than maybe some of the ones that would be viewed as more useful to neighbors. If, if you assume that it was gonna go more in that direction, would that still be your strong preference to see that outcome that it be an interior design that it be a lawyer's office and urgent care things of that nature but as i understand it mark that there's there would be no zoning petition to do that no rezoning petition they, they have the ability to do that now. correct, that correct? Yes, sir. That, yeah, that's I, what I'm saying. I, would, would the neighbors still view those kinds of uses as um substantially preferable to the conversion to residential I think the overriding principle is that we feel like um, this is a change in what was promised to us. They they were granted uh, the opportunity to build a building that was so dramatically different than what originally was proposed, and a big a big part of that was we're not going to just have three hundred and. 80 apartments, we're going to have retail space and commercial space. Um, I, I, um, as a landlord myself, I, I don't think someone should specify too finely what you can, what you can put in there. But this is a, this is a dramatic change and they were granted approval, um, to do one thing. And now they're, they're saying we changed our mind. And, right. So and I, I totally appreciate the frustration on the, the change. Um, I just want to be realistic about what what can go in there because I have not found, again, this is anecdotal, but I've not found the tenants that have occupied those spaces that, that are walkable to me to be particularly useful to me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and while, you know, if they were things like a deli or a bagel shop or a dry cleaner or a barber shop, um, I would find them to be highly useful and I'd be able to walk to them. Uh, what, I, what I've ended up with in Plaza Midwood has probably not been what the what was desired, um, similar to the conversations y'all had, 
when you said this is what we want. We want this space that's retail and office. So again, I just want to be open or, or very transparent about what I think more likely outcomes are if we hold them to this uh, previously committed office retail space. And again, that it sounds like that might still be preferable to the neighbors than the conversion to residential. Um, but I, th I think it's worth acknowledging, and I want to make sure we're all on the same page, that it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a quote unquote traditional retail use because um, oftentimes we found that not to be the case. Um, I think that's, I think that's very fair. Marcus. Okay. Mr. Mr. Brown, um, what, I mean, if, if we were to grant this next month or sometime thereafter, would they just immediately begin the conversion, whatever, whatever outfit that required or, um, have there been any active discussions with anybody still working, trying to rent this? And um, can you speak to if you think, and maybe this isn't your place either, but can you speak to if you think that the square per square foot cost that they are offering or the um, willingness or lack thereof to, to subdivide is maybe par for the course in that area? Uh, I see Richard Rudd is on, but I, his connection may be fading. I would let him answer, but if not, I'll try. There are, believe it or not, after all this time, now some ongoing discussions um, with a commercial user. Um, so we are hopeful that that comes to fruition. Um, however, in our conversation, and Richard, feel free to dive in if you're able, um, what we don't want, you know, we spent almost a year getting to this point. If those fall through, um, we, ju we just don't want to be sitting here a year or two later with vacant space on the corner. And so we'd like the flexibility our hope is that the commercial, we're able to, to find a commercial tenant that fits. And it looks like Richard's struggling with the signal. Sorry. So the one thing I'll add, and then I see uh, some other folks have questions, so I'll- Can you hear me? I'll pass the baton. Uh, well, we can, but not well. Can I don't think it's gonna work. Your, your signal's cutting out too severely for us yeah, to understand. Barely, only heard half of me. And Mr. Yeah. Rose, we can't we can't hear you. Let me see if I can on my phone. Mr. Rose, I don't think we're going to be able to, to hear you. Um, but the one thing I'll add before we go to other questions is, is simply, Mr. Brown, I, I think it might be worth considering before this comes back to the council um, if there's the possibility to meet in the middle somewhere and say a portion of this, because we do have a, a housing need in this community, um, you know, eight units or four units or two units is not going to make a big dent in it, but it doesn't hurt it either. Um, but I, I do understand the neighbor's desire to maintain um, hope for some retail and service oriented uh, uses there. So I would ask that one of the conversations you have with your client be, is there the opportunity to ask for part of this space to be allowed for conversion to residential and part of it to remain um, committed as a retail office commercial use, which would then, you know, continue to incentivize the developer to pursue those sorts of tenants. So that's all for now, Mr. Winston. Thank you. Will do. Ms. Mr. Rose, um, if you try to turn your camera off, we may be able to hear you a little bit better. Um, while he's doing that, um, Mr. Petten uh, did have an answer to one of your questions, so I'll let him answer that. Yeah, this was uh, Councilmember Eggleston. The previous site plan was approved for up to 25,000 square feet of commercial uses that may serve the general public. That shall include retail, general office, medical office, grocery store, financial institution, pharmacy, and restaurant uses. Uh, no more than 15,000 square feet of the allowable commercial square footage may be devoted to retail uses, except in the case of a grocery store, that could be up to 25,000 square feet. So that's, uh, you're correct. It would allow general office, medical office uses, as well as a financial institution and pharmacy. Thank you. So, um, before we get to, to Mr. Driggs, um, you know, I, I, I did hear Mr. Brown um, respond uh, to uh, Mr. Penny and said that, you know, there could be the possibility of, of pushing this back. Um, I, I, you know, obviously I'm a, a big fan of ground floor retail, um, but that usually works in areas where there's high pedestrian traffic. Um, and where this development is, um, there isn't much pedestrian traffic. There is Midtown that's about a mile away on a greenway, um, but you wouldn't really pass this place if you were 
uh, at least that corner um, if you're coming out of that residential building. But there are things that are happening up and down Moorhead, um, right? We have uh, uh, Pearl, the Pearl District, the Innovation District, um, and other developments going on up and down Moorhead. Um, so perhaps there, we, we could take a, a broader look um, at what ground floor, what, what Moorhead is, is looking like in terms of ground floor retail um, um, and pedestrian, future pedestrian traffic. Um, but maybe that's just an idea, um, especially given the petitioner's uh, potential consideration um, for a, a long look at this thing. Um, Mr. Driggs, I'll recognize you for questions and comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Winston. Uh, I just wanted to say to the protesters here that uh, I, I can certainly feel your pain uh, and frustration uh, given the history that we just heard. <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, without any prejudgment on my part, I'll look at this and, and make my decision later, but uh, we are constrained in terms of the dimensions of the decision we can make here. So this is a land use decision, which means that we cannot kind of reach a conclusion about the good faith conduct or otherwise of the petitioner. And uh, what strikes me is that the deal that was done in 2013, I think this was actually my first council meeting, uh, uh, did include uses other than just the kind of retail that you'd like to see there. So even if you construe that as a promise, which is not exactly the way I would interpret it, but uh, I understand that that was the conversation that went on then, but the outcome did not specify the exact kind of use that you would like to see there now. And we are not really in a position to impose that. We, we can't say it's got to be a coffee shop or it's got to be this. And uh, I agree with the observation that maybe the foot traffic wasn't good there or the parking didn't work and it's really just not a suitable retail location. So uh, I, I just, it, as we consider this for the, for the next month, um, bear in mind that we have certain, uh, I'll call them constraints. There are certain things that we can think about when we decide whether or not to allow this. And uh, there are some of the issues you've cited that uh, unfortunately cannot have but to carry too much weight in our decision. And uh, I'm available to, to anybody that uh, would like to talk to me about it. Uh, I'm sure that it will be handled very capably by Mr. Eggleston. But uh, those are just a couple of observations uh, as I think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. Um, Ms. Asmara, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Winston. My, my question was already asked by Mr. Eggleston in terms of working with um, uh, Bob and see if there is a middle ground here, Mr. Brown. I know you are making good faith attempt here, um, but I would like to see, uh, Bob is right, the market condition has changed now that COVID is uh, uh, behind us. And I see that retail is improving all over the city. Uh, I have seen restaurants that were shut down, um, many retail shops that were shut down, and now we are seeing business back up again. So uh, I, I wonder, uh, considering the market conditions uh, that is improving, what, what does the retail scene would look like for at least next six months, year or two, three years down the road? Uh, I understand some of this rezoning petition work is done uh, a year in advance, six months. I, I know it takes six months for you to just to get to the hearing. I, I get it. So this was probably filed during the time where retails were really struggling, and I get that. So uh, I, I think Bob made some really good points that I, we got to explore. Um, uh, so I would like to hear from you, Mr. Brown, and petitioner in a follow-up report as to what we can do to address some of the concerns that residents are bringing up. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Rose, um, did you try to turn off your camera? And if you have, um, would you like to respond to question or comment that was posed to you? Uh, he, he sent me a text and told me his audio is still breaking up. So we'll. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. Phipps? I got a question for... Uh, it's Mr. still breaking Pitt. up. Sorry. Uh -huh. I'll be there in person next. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Rose. 
Mr. Patton, um, do we have any examples where there's been a, a, a transition from previously approved ground floor retail to something else in any of the petitions that we've uh, uh, discussed around the dais over these many years? I, I, no, I'm sure there's some, yeah. I can't think of any off the top of my head. We have such a volume of them, but I know that we do have, we've probably had a few where we've converted some existing uh, spaces from residential or from, excuse me, from non-residential to residential. And I think, as I mentioned, I know we have a lot of active petitions and current petitions that were recently approved that have conversion rights uh, that would do that without needing to come back for a rezoning. So it's already somewhat built into uh, the project from the get-go just to anticipate that potential need and change. Uh, but I can try to look out and see if there's uh, there have been a few that were specific that had it already approved and then came back to ask for some of that transition or conversion after the fact, uh, but certainly something I'd have to provide to you uh, outside of this meeting, either in a follow-up email to everybody or a uh, follow-up report uh, at our next meeting. Thank you. I, w I look forward to it. One of my main concerns is that I know we have uh, a couple of parking decks along the Blue Line extension that's got ground floor retail. I would hate to see those things transition um, from ground floor retail to additional parking. So, thank you. Second. Um, with that said, I, unless any other council members have comments or questions, I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Motion, uh, motion has been properly made and seconded. I'm a yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Yes. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Ms. Ajmira had to leave. Um, Mr. Phipps. Yes. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item uh, number 36, rezoning petition. Thank you. We will move on to item 36, rezoning petition 2021. Dash 222 by Gerald Kidd. Approximately 21.16 acres bound by the west side of Beatty's Ford Road, south side of Cowboy Lane, and north side of Kidd Lane. It's in the ETJ um, uh, in County Commission District 2, uh, which is held by Ms. Leak. And the closest city council district is District 2, um, Mr. Graham's district. Uh, the current zoning is R3 single family residential and the proposed zoning is R8 multifamily residential conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation, environment, and site design. Um, uh, there is, uh, uh, a, uh, excuse me, a, 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 excuse me, there is, uh, uh, the speaker against, so the petitioner, Rad Schneider, will have 10 minutes after Mr. Petten's presentation. Thank you. The mic on 222 is approximately 21.16 acres on Beatty's Ford and Kid Lane, as well as Cowboy Lane. Current zoning is R3, and the proposed zoning is R8 MF conditional. <clears throat> Adopted future land use, uh, the slide doesn't have it listed out, but it is the Northwest District Plan that does have a recommendation of single family uses up to four dwelling units per acre. Uh, this petition does meet general development policy criteria for over six dwelling units per acre. Uh, the proposal itself would be for up to 123 single family attached townhome units, limit maximum building height to 40 feet. Uh, would provide right of way for the future Fred D. Alexander Road extension. That's uh, that wide swath of land on the north side, just along Cowboy Lane. Uh, access would be from Beatty's Ford Road and Kid Lane. Uh, does provide for right and left turn lanes into the site along Beatty's Ford, as well as installing an eight foot planting strip and 12 foot multi use path along that frontage on Beatty's Ford as well. A uh, two-car garage would be uh, provided for each unit with an additional two spaces within the driveway area. It does commit to a 50-foot Class C buffer uh, where the site abuts existing residential areas and does include architectural standards related to raised entrances, pitched roofs, corner end unit architectural details, and expansive blank walls and garage doors. 
Just a note on the future Fred D. Alexander extension, uh, that road is shown in that location, the actual location that's uh, on the adopted uh, transportation map uh, is a little bit, I think, further south on the site. Uh, so while that's being proposed in a new location, just for everybody's understanding, that realignment or, or adjusted alignment would have to go through a whole separate map amendment uh, with our regional transportation group. Uh, so that's a process that would be done outside of, of the rezoning process, but they would be providing that right of way. They're just currently proposing it in an area that uh, would have to be approved uh, through a separate process as well. Uh, but that Fred D. Alexander extension would still be part of the project. Uh, staff does recommend approval of the petition. Uh, we do have some outstanding issues from transportation, environment, and site design to be resolved. Uh, while it's inconsistent with the Northwest District Plan uh, for a density recommendation of up to four DUA, it does meet the general development policies uh, for consideration of over six dwelling units per acre. And with that, we'll take any questions uh, you may have following the petitioner's presentation and presentation from members of the community. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, Rad Schneider, uh, you have 10 minutes. All right, uh, can, can everybody hear me okay and see me okay? Uh, we can hear you just great and we oh. have your presentation up. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilman Winston and the rest of council. Uh, my name is Rad Schneider and I'm the Director um, of Acquisitions for Redwood USA LLC. I was here back in, uh, January for a public hearing on Rocky River Road. Um, and so I'll try to go through this kind of quickly because you might remember uh, a lot of the company information. So I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, Redwood is a developer and property management company of single story apartment rental neighborhoods. So everything we do is two bedroom, two bath uh, with an attached two car garage. Uh, we have over 100 neighborhoods uh, spanned across eight states. And to this point, we have never sold the neighborhood and we have no intention to. Uh, next slide. We currently have uh, 500 employees uh, plus and counting. Uh, majority of that is going to be in the field, your service technicians, your leasing professionals. We do have over uh, 100 in our corporate headquarters, which is located in Independence, Ohio, which is just south of downtown Cleveland. Next slide. Take a look at our market presence there. We're mostly throughout the Midwest. Um, we started in the Southeast uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, and then worked our way into the uh, Charlotte MSA. Next slide. Uh, within Charlotte, we've got uh, four, four properties, uh, either under construction or under contract, including the one we're discussing uh, this evening, along with sites throughout Concord, um, Kannapolis, Statesville, Troutman, uh, Lake Wiley. Next slide. Some key facts about us is we have uh, almost 14,000 apartment homes. Uh, we typically do about 2,000 every year. We closed on 2,300 last year. We're trying to close on about 2,800 this year. Uh, so it's a big year plan for us. Uh, we are market rate, so we're not age restricted or anything like that. Uh, with that said, we do tend to attract uh, empty nesters uh, with 70% of our current portfolio, por portfolio excuse me, uh, being empty nesters. Um, and as a result of that, we typically don't get as many school aged children per apartment home compared to a, you know, like a single family development. So next slide. And of course, we have a uh, background in credit checks. Um, that's usually an important thing for the neighborhoods. And we you know, discuss that throughout the neighborhood meetings. Um, next slide. Uh, some of the important things about our property management that we take pride in are uh, ranked uh, second nationally in power rankings by multifamily executive. Uh, again, we always have an on-site neighborhood uh, manager and service technician throughout the normal working hours. We also have 24-hour uh, service availability in case something happens in the off hours that they can call. Uh, we do things like power washing of all of our buildings throughout a neighborhood every two to three years. Uh, we do, um, you know, stormwater maintenance, gutters every spring, concrete inspections, and also we paint every unit at every turn. So after somebody moves out and before somebody moves in, all the walls get repainted. Um, and as a testament to that, our, our oldest property uh, in Olmsted uh, Township, Ohio, uh, which was built in the early 2000s, actually has our highest rents on a um, square footage basis. Next slide. So you can take a look at um, our exteriors. Again, everything, uh, two bedroom, two bath, attached two car garage, typically four to six units of building. Uh, I believe in the city of Charlotte, we can't go above six anyway. Um, we do extensive landscaping and really more of an emphasis on green space. We don't do amenities like pool, pools and clubhouses and, and things of that nature. Next slide. Take a look at our uh, interiors. A big emphasis on open floor plans. Uh, it's great for natural lighting. Uh, everything's uh, floor plans start at 1300 net rentable square feet about 
you know, stainless steel appliances, uh, LTV flooring throughout with the exception of the bedrooms uh, and granite countertops as well. Next slide. A uh, couple examples of our floor plans. Uh, the forest wood is the most common, typically 60% or so of the units in a um, neighborhood is forest wood. The cape wood is the largest unit and there's the fewest of those. Uh, that's basically, that's just the forest wood, but we, we put a sunroom on the side. Um, next slide. Willow wood is the second most popular. It's a little bit more, even more open space. You can see an image of it on the, on the left there. You can see how the uh, living space and the uh, kitchen kind of really blend together there. We've got hundreds of years of experience um, across our executive management team and leadership team uh, between acquisitions, construction, development, finance, and operations. Uh, we actually have an in-house construction management company called Redwood Construction. So between land development, property management, construction, we are a, a vertically integrated company. Next slide. And that's just the other one, so next slide. Now the site, uh, 7221 uh, Beatty's Ford Road. Uh, as, as David said, we're looking at doing about 26 acres, um, current zoning from R3, looking to go to R8 MF. Uh, there is the road alignment issue that, we, that we're still currently working through. It's, it's currently basically running through the middle of the site. It's been there for a while. It's a reserve corridor essentially for um, a, a future boulevard. And so in order to accommodate the, de accommodate the development, we would have to move that um, to the north because we just can't have it obviously running through the, through the middle of the site plan. So that is why I requested a uh, rezoning contingent um, upon that, which is a separate process that will be run through CDOT. So we're looking at 123 proposed apartment homes uh, at, at just under um, five apartment homes per acre. So this is a, a lower density development, uh, similar to single family. Uh, there is an existing pond on site and wetlands that were deemed non-jurisdictional. So we can work to repurpose that. And that is the goal. That is why we have it drawn that way. We'll have to do some modifications to the existing pond uh, to get it to city uh, requirements, but we've, we've done that before. And so, you know, we like to repurpose those ponds if, if we can. Um, there's going to be two points of access along uh, Kid and Beatty's Ford, along with um, along with the appropriate road improvements as well as required by the city and NCDOT. So, uh, with that, that's pretty much uh, that's that's presentation on my end, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Schneider. Um, we do have a, a speaker uh, against Misty Parker who's in the building with us. Thank you for coming on out and waiting. Uh, you have 10 minutes once you get up to the podium. The lectern. So hi, my name is Missy Parker, and unfortunately I was not prepared for this meeting because um, the ladder that came, um, came this weekend. And so I was on vacation, opened it up when I got home at 4.30 this afternoon and rushed down here to be here for this meeting. So excuse my presentation. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Mecklenburg County. Um, I'm here to ask you to reconsider this based on many things. Um, many of those is the quality of life in this area is drastically changing fast. And I heard Ms. Johnson say something that really resonated with me, the cumulus effect. Um, right now, we have approved one, when you come out of Cowboy Lane, you have approved one housing development with over 100 houses. Behind me and surrounding Cowboy Lane over to Miranda Road, you have approved over 300 rental properties. He is asking for 130, 23 rental properties. I understand needs for homes, but we need some single family homes for sale also in this area. The, the commute of, a, of, Cowboy, of Cowboy Lane coming out on Beatty's Ford Road is unreasonable at this point. And the houses over across from Cowboy Lane are not built yet. They're in process. This is not built yet, and the 300 plus has not been built yet. And we already cannot get out of our private driveways, Cowboy Lane, Kid Lane, McClure. We're not getting out of our properties now. And the subdivisions that are coming in are taking our quality of life, things that we've worked hard. I, I plan to retire there, and now this is being taken from me because he's planning on moving this road from where it was when I built my home and bought my home, that road was over in the middle of that road. I bought my home based on that. Now, because they want a subdivision there, they want to push that four lane road on top of Cowboy Lane to all of us who have lived here our whole lives. I, I'm asking for help. Um, I've reached out to different departments. I've reached out because of this road. Um, and it did get 
proposed got um, pushed out. So we were not, we did not have a, a proposal or speak about it. But Cowboy Lane and, and the areas of people right here, we're given overran by subdivisions with rental homes because family housing of cowboy or family housing of farms have been sold, which is the, the greater part of that North Mech area, a lot of farmland. Families are dying out and all the properties are being sold for subdivisions. Um, the things that are gonna affect us is, is the cars, car pollution, noise pollution, um, taking down all the trees and everything that is being bulldozed down um, right in front of us, right behind us, and now right beside us. Um, there's trees in here that probably would go um, on the historical society. We have oak trees bigger than you guys have ever seen in your life. Um, our emergency times are low. Um, with, with the development of the piece behind us, we are exhibiting a lot of um, shootings and things in there that um, are random because the houses have all been abandoned. Um, our, our return times on police or fire or anything is very low now. So now you're gonna add in another 800 homes, two, two cars per home, 1,600 cars, and within one mile down Miranda Road, you're adding in another 250 car, car houses, and that's within a mile of Miranda Road and this subdivision and the other two that have been approved. So I'm just asking you to please consider the people that live there. Um, we need someone to speak up for us. We need help. And, and right now we're, we're getting bulldozed. And, and I want someone to look out for us and I want someone to help us and I want someone to speak to me about this. And I want to not get letters the day I come home on vacation <laughs> and have to stand up here and do this. Um, some of the things my, um, uh, and no one on Cowboy Lane received the letter at all. So my frantic rush down here, I tried calling residents on Cowboy and Kid Lane. No one else even got the letter. So I got a letter dated March the 31st sometime this weekend. Um, I just see that as not a great opportunity to allow us to speak. So at the very least, this needs to be pushed out and allow the members of this area to have a say so that you can hear us. More houses is not necessarily always better. Maybe single family homes are not a bad thing. Um, rental, not everything needs to be a rental. Allow people to purchase and own their homes and have some ownership and have some pride in their homes, just like we do that are already living on Cowboy Lane. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Ms. Parker. Uh, Mr. Schneider, you have three minutes uh, for a, two minutes. Sorry, two minutes uh, for a rebuttal, if you choose to use it. Uh, yes, I, I will. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, I you know I I'll, I'll just say I you know I understand the the, the road alignment. You know, from my discussion, uh, you know, with the family who owns this property, it's it's been an issue within the neighborhood for um, you know for a while. Um, you know, it, it does impact the value of, of their land, um, too, um, which is why it's a delicate balance of, of figuring out, you know, how we can get this to work. It, it's also why I wanted to structure the rezoning uh, request this way, because I, understanding it's a delicate issue, I, I wanted to have the rezoning dependent on the separate process through CDOT, because through CDOT, they have their own public outreach. Um, where, where people can, can, can speak either out or, or for against it. So um, I also told the family who owns this property, I wasn't, I wasn't gonna go through and move the road unless I knew I could get my rezoning because it didn't make any sense to, to um, you know, move the road and make an impact on the neighborhood if um, I was not able to get a favorable rezoning decision. So I did really try hard to structure this so that really the, the, the risk is on us, Redwood. I mean, we're the ones that have spent um, you know, close to six figures on this so far to get it to this point. Um, and at the end of the day, if, if um, we can't get the road moved, we lose out, even if it's a favorable rezoning, um, and the city can, you know, hang on to the, the, the current placement of the road um, and, and, you know, just move forward with that. So um, I, do, I do want, you know, council in the neighborhood to, to understand that, you know, we're, we're doing our best with, uh, with a difficult situation. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Graham, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Winston. Uh, uh, 
have the neighborhood meeting been held yet? Yes, it 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 does. Uh, yes, there, there seems to have been a community meeting um, with nine people um, uh, attended. Uh, the staff or the petitioner have any feedback on? Yeah, can I get some feedback based on those nine that attended the meeting? And I'm looking through my notes quickly. And so if someone could just kind of give me an, uh, just a, an update on the community meeting and uh, how that went and... Um, just curious. Mr. Patton. Yeah, I, I, the date that we have in our file is that it was held on Thursday, February 17th. I'll let the petitioner speak to what was covered and, and what the uh, conversation was, but there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine attendees listed. Uh, again, that was February 17th, uh, but I'll defer to the petitioner for any other details. Uh, yeah, Rad here. So, so yes, mo we did hold the neighborhood meeting. Um, you know, it went over uh, fairly well. Most of most of the concerns uh, were related to the road improvements um, and what type of road improvements there would be. We didn't have a full answer on that at the time, just because we were still waiting on the first round of staff comments to come back. Um, but but most of the people that asked the questions about road improvements were on the other other side of Kid Lane from us, because I guess their property lines. Uh, extend slightly into that road, so they were they were concerned about how that was going to impact their their property line, which we were able to respond with. The the road improvements are going to occur on our half of the road, so they should they shouldn't have to worry about us, you know, having to go ask permission to, to dig up their front yard to put to put curb and gutter in. So that that was the primary concern. There there wasn't too much on the um, on the road alignment specifically at that meeting. Yeah, what's the young lady who just recently spoke? Was she was she in attendance? She is shake. Miss uh, Parker is shaking her head no, in the room. Uh, would you like to respond to Mr. Graham, Miss Parker? Um, sir, I was not informed of the meeting, and I did not attend the meeting. And I can honestly say, no one on Cowboy Lane knows about this meeting either. So this may be a lane, this may have been Kid Lane, which is the other side of it. And I think I was out there visiting with the petitioner back in February. I think I'm, I was there uh, on Bayes Fort Road. Um, and I think I know exactly what, what that, that road that you're talking about. Ours is a uh, private driveway. It's a private driver for sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, I was there um, earlier in the year. Okay. But thank you, Mr. Winston. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Are there any other questions or comments from council members? Move to close. Uh, second. A uh, motion has been properly made and seconded. We'll have a roll call vote. I'm a yes. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs. Yes. Mr. Eggleston. Mr. Eggleston just had to log off. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Newton. Yes. Ms. Watlington. Yes. Mr. Phipps. Yes. Thank you very much. We will move on to put uh, item number 37, uh, rezoning petition 2021-226 by AREP Galloway, LLC. Approximately 8.02 acres located on the south side of Galloway Road, east of Claude Freeman Drive, and north of West Mallard Creek Church Road in Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's District. The current zoning is R3 single family residential and the proposed zoning is as UR2 urban residential uh, conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation. We do have a speaker against this. So after Mr. Petten's presentation, uh, Ms. Grant, you will have 10 minutes. Thank you. 
Thank you. 2021 226, eight acres on Galloway Road, uh, currently zoned R3, and the proposed zoning is for UR2 conditional. Uh, adopted future land use from the Northeast Area Plan recommends four DUA, uh, single or residential four DUA. General development policies uh, provide policy guidance uh, up to six dwelling units per acre. Uh, this petition proposes up to 48 townhome units. Uh, that would limit building height to 48 feet. Vehicular access would come off Galloway Road. Uh, we do have eight visitor parking spaces that are being uh, proposed to be provided. Uh, also, 12-foot multi-use path connecting Arbor Vista Drive to the proposed public street. That's uh, down at the south end of the project where uh, the, uh, there is no development proposed, just that multi-use path and tree save area. Uh, does provide an eight-foot planting strip and eight-foot sidewalk along the Galloway Road frontage, as well as landscape buffers along both property lines neighboring the single-family, or excuse me, the property line neighboring single-family residential homes. Uh, each town home unit will also have a garage, and architectural standards uh, have been worked into the petition as well. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. Do have some outstanding issues related to transportation to be resolved. While it's inconsistent with the Northeast Area Plan recommendation of up to four DUA, it does meet the general development policies uh, for up to six dwelling units per acre. Uh, and so, again, staff does recommend approval. We'll be happy to take questions following uh, both presentations. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, we have three speakers for uh, Jim Ryan, Weston Bowles, and Bridget Grant. Um, Ms. Grant, I would imagine that you are coordinating the presentation. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, thank you, Council Member Winston. Good evening, members of Council, members of the Zoning Committee, Bridget Grant, Land Use Consultant with Moran Van Allen. Pleased to be here today. It's actually Cameron Fox of Pulte and Weston Bowles of W.K. Dixon. Um, given we have some opposition, I'm going to give a little longer presentation. As Dave mentioned, this is an eight, just over an eight-acre site located on Galloway Road. As you can see, there are a number of zoning districts in the area, a range of densities that have already been developed. If we're looking ahead at the 2040 place type map recommendation, also consistent with the existing land use plan, it supports N1 uses, which is also um, attached single family developments. We believe we're consistent with four of the 2040 comp plan policies. When you look at things at a high level, we're changing the zoning from R3 to the UR2 CD. Again, that density is just under six dwelling units an acre. We're proposing up to 48 single family attached residential units. And we have a combination of maintaining trees and replanting along the boundary, as well as architectural commitments to the quality to be developed on the site and a max height that's consistent with surrounding residential. We're also including an amenity trail based off of some of the existing conditions on the site and have a pretty generous amount of open space. At this point in time, approximately 39% of the, of the site is maintained as open space. So this is a rendered version of the current plan that was filed with staff. And as you can see, there's extensive tree save and open space at the back of the site with healthy mature tree canopy that we're proposing to keep and amenitize with some existing trails. Since that submittal, we've continued to work with the adjacent neighbors in the Claybrook community to address their concerns and have made some of the following changes. So we've limited the height of the units along the Claybrook side of the site to a maximum of two stories. And we've increased our rear yard from 40 feet up to 55 feet, hoping to address some of their concerns. We've also agreed to put in um, a minimum five foot vinyl privacy fence along this privacy edge. So the last thing I'd like to mention about working with the residents, they also mentioned that they have some concern on the overall site design and why all of the units were pushed toward the front of the site rather than spreading the density throughout the site. So just quickly, it's essentially a clustering of units to the front of the site to provide that large, cohesive and protected natural area to the back of the site to stay out of some of those buffers. If we were to spread those units further to the left, it would require a significant creek crossing. You can see that hatching in the area. And ultimately, it would become cost prohibitive the number of units we have on the site due to the nature of the crossing and then a required connection to Arbor Vista. We essentially would only get a handful of the units that would actually move to the left. So given that condition, we thought it was more relevant and important for us to save that open space and tree save. 
So that said, we are optimistic that our attempts to respond to the neighborhood concerns through the height limitations on the portion of the site closest to their homes by increasing that buffer size an additional 15 feet and the offer of the fence will hopefully garner some of the community support as we continue to work through this process. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions after um, the other side has an opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Grant. Um, stand by um, because uh, Marek Siska uh, is yes. here to speak against. Um, Mr. Siska, you have 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having me uh, and appreciate uh, Bridget and her team. We have worked with them. Um, uh, two of her team came to the neighborhood. Several of us walked through the property and, and talked about our concerns and they have addressed some of them. Uh, lowering the height of the, uh, of the units was critical because m many of the properties on our neighborhood are below the property uh, that's proposed to be uh, developed. And so having three-story uh, townhomes looking down into, into the properties was unacceptable. They've increased uh, the distance, which is great. They've uh, promised a fence. Uh, we've addressed um, drainage. We have a couple of homes that have some drainage issues and, and they committed to working with us as they develop it. They certainly can't promise to make it better, but they certainly won't make it worse. Um, so we do appreciate that. In, in the end of the day, though, we have a, a beautiful, very private uh, single family home neighbor neighborhood. And uh, there's a single family home neighborhood on the other side of the property. And our ultimate desire would be to have nice single family homes on this piece of property and it would flow so much better uh, with the surrounding area. And I think it would be great for everybody's property value. Uh, were, the, were the rezoning uh, petition to go through, then we have to address the density. Well, the density is, uh, it meets the requirement of the, uh, of the letter of the law, I would say, of uh, six units per acre. If you take, uh, you know, eight acres and 48 units, you can do the math. Uh, but the units are all built on half of the property. So we're really talking about a density of almost 12 units per acre. So I did talk to Bridget about that and she explained, yeah, there's, there's, there's some parts of the property that are unbuildable. It could drive uh, the cost of having to put a road in. And so the other alternative is if it were to get approved, have fewer units. Um, and then that way they wouldn't all be so close. They could be spread out, uh, but you wouldn't be able to put 48 units. Um, and of course, that then affects the business case of, uh, of, of Pulte. So, you know, we're willing to, to have these discussions, but our ultimate desire is, is single family homes, or if it does get rezoned, to have fewer units uh, in that area so, so that it's, uh, there's less intrusion uh, into our backyards by seeing people's homes and seeing people on their, on their decks or in their backyards. So that's what I have to say. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Siska. Um, Ms. Grant, you have two minutes uh, for a rebuttal, if you so choose. Just quickly, I want, want to thank the residents of Claybrook for the time that they gave us. We do think that their input helped us ultimately develop a better plan. And while we did push the density towards the front, towards Galloway, I'm bringing this slide back up to just show it is not very often that we get to preserve 39% of a site with mature tree canopy and put it in a place where there's tree save rather than in individual homeowners backyards where we all know that tree canopy doesn't tend to stay. So with that, I'm happy to answer any council questions. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Grant. I'm looking to Ms. Jackson to see if uh, we have any questions or comments from council members. Mr. Grant, I'm sorry, I do have one comment, uh, Mr. Jo Winston. Ms. Johnson, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask the developer, is there a way to have this, this amount of tree save and, and, and also have more concessions for the, the residents? It, it, is there a, uh, I know that the whole single family, I know that's, you know, that's not your proposal, but can you speak to what he said about lowering the, 
the density um, for the units. Um, can, can you just talk to me a little bit about that, Bridget? I can, thank you for your question. So again, we're aligned with the density of the six dwelling units per acre that's supported by the general development policies and by um, the future development plans. For us, it was a matter of if we decrease the density, it's, it's not a feasible project, it's a business decision. And taking it to, again, the single family option really did have a dramatic impact on the overall site plan and our ability to keep and maintain that tree save, as well as having to culvert over a creek that's in that area and provide connectivity to Arbor Vista. And so when we had a chance to work with the neighbors, we, you know, we, we took a long list and we took our comments and went back and I described it as a pushing and pulling. We did a lot of work to shift things around as much as possible so we could really decrease those heights, increase those buffers and get the, pro the fence, I believe it's over 800 feet of five foot privacy fence along that line. And we were again optimistic that that was a good faith effort for us to come to a common space. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Graham, we just want to confirm your hand is still up. Um, imagine that's from the last petition. Yes, sir. All right, thank you very much. Um, with that, there's no other questions or comments. Oops, second. Motion has been uh, made and properly second. And we'll start the roll call. I'm a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston had to jump yes. off. Uh, Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I think that was the last uh, petition that had opposition. Um, so we'll move on to item number 38, rezoning petition 2021-230 by Providence Group Capital LLC. This is approximately 0.4 acres located on the east side of South Tryon Street, north of Remount Road, and south of Dunavant Street in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's district. The current zoning is transit-oriented development neighborhood center, and the proposed zoning is transit-oriented development urban center. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Uh, since there is no um, opposition, um, we have two speakers for uh, Mr. J, uh, J.Q. Freeman and Keith uh, McVean. Uh, Mr. McVean, I assume you will be speaking for both. You have three minutes. Yes, sir. Happy to do so. I'll, I'll wait on Dave. Oh, <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> trying to get out. Trying to, that's okay. Moving too fast. That's all right. We'll, we'll move just as quick. 2021, 230. Second just, time. <laughs> 0.4 acres located on South Tryon Street, uh, just north of Remount Road. Uh, the current zoning is TODNC. The proposed zoning is for TODUC. Uh, New Bern Station Area Plan does recommend plan does recommend uh, transit-oriented development uh, mixed for this site, so the petition would be consistent. Uh, the NC to UC is primarily based on the addition of a new stop, I believe, uh, just on the backside of Rampart. I think this is close enough within that area. Uh, the petitioner can certainly jump in and correct when they do their presentation, but I believe that's the trend that we've seen, bless you, on Tryon, uh, and we'll see that with this parcel as well. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition. It's a conventional TOD petition, so no conditions or site plan uh, to speak of, no outstanding issues. As mentioned, it's consistent with the New Bern Station area plan, and we'll be happy to take any questions uh, following Mr. McVeigh's presentation. Thank you. Now, Mr. McVeigh, you have three minutes. Uh, good evening, Council Member Winston, members of Council, members of the Zoning Committee, Keith McVeigh with Moore Van Allen, Jeff Brown of our firm and I are assisting Providence Group Capital uh, with this rezoning petition. Uh, Dave has done a good job explaining the, the circumstances of the site where it is. If you could go to the next slide. As Dave mentioned, we are within a half mile walk of the future Rampart Station, which is on the just to the north of the site, just a little bit over a half mile from the existing Scaly Park Station. So that's how the site qualifies for the TOD Urban Center. It's the distance to that future station at Rampart. Uh, next slide. And as Dave mentioned, consistent with the New Bern Station Area Plan recommendation for transit supportive districts, there's already a, a good amount of transit urban, TOD Urban Center zoning around us. Uh, and the proposal would be consistent with, with that. 
but that was uh, that district that's already established on those parcels. Uh, JQ Freeman with Province Group Capital is also on the line. We're happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Mr. McBain. Um, do we have any questions or comments from council? Um, seeing and hearing none, I'll make a motion to close the public Second. hearing. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Um, I am a yes. Uh, Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. We will move on to item number 39. Rezoning petition 2021-231 by Emory Investment Corporation, which is approximately 0.5 acres located at the intersection of Pearson Drive and Chippendale Road, east of Monroe Road, in Council District 5, Mr. Newton's district. The current zoning is R5 single-family residential, and the proposed zoning is R6 single-family residential. Staff recommends approval of this petition. Uh, we do not have any speakers against this rezoning. Um, so after Mr. Petten's presentation, uh, Mr. Pridemore will have three minutes. Thank you. Mike, on 2021-231 uh, is just under a half acre. It's 0.45 on the inter intersection of Pearson and Chippendale Road. And the existing zoning is R5, and the proposed zoning is for a conventional R6 district. Uh, the adoptive future land use does recommend single family uses up to five DUA for the site. Uh, staff does recommend approval of the petition. It's conventional, so again, no site plan or conditions to uh, consider and no outstanding issues to be resolved. Uh, and as mentioned, it's, it's consistent with single family uses, uh, but at that R6 versus R5, it's just slightly above what that recommended density is. Uh, I believe that's due to just some lot configurations and desire to subdivide uh, the property and that R6 district gives a little bit uh, more flexibility with the lot size and configuration on that corner of Chippendale and Pearson. Uh, certainly petitioner can answer some of those questions, uh, but again, this is a conventional petition, so all uses in R6, which is primarily all residential, would be permitted. Uh, we'll be happy to take any questions following uh, Mr. Pridemore's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Brandon Pridemore, uh, you have three minutes. Mr. Pridemore on. On council. Yes. Mr. Pridemore is on. Ms. Jackson just pulling him up. Yeah. Uh, yes, Councilman Winston, can you hear me, sir? Oh, we do hear you now, Mr. Pridemore. You have uh, three minutes. <laughs> thank thank you. you. We're getting switched over. Uh, council members and zoning committee members, thank you for your patience tonight. I know it's been a long night. Uh, don't really have too much more to add. Uh, what we wanted to say was uh, the client Emory Investment is simply looking to create two single family opportunities there. Uh, as you can see on the corner of, of Pearson Drive there, the lot is a little bit oversized, but under the uh, R5 zoning district, uh, we don't quite meet the density requirement. We meet the lot width requirement. So we will be very consistent with what's been developed, but the R6 would allow us to be able to sub by that lot. So we're here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions or comments from council members? Move to close. Second. Second. Motion has been properly made and seconded. I am a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Uh, Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. And with that, we will uh, move on to agenda item number 40. Rezoning petition 2021-236 by RJS Properties. It's approximately 1.83 acres located on the south side of Roundtree Road and north side of Minuet Lane, west of Old Pineville Road in Council District 3, Miss Watlington's district. The current zoning is I-2 General Industrial and the proposed zoning is TOD, Transit Oriented Development Community Center. Staff, staff recommends approval of this petition. And again, since we have no opposition. Uh, the petitioner will have 
three minutes after Mr. Petten's presentation. All right, thank you. 2021 236, 1.83 acres on Roundtree Road. Also has some frontage down on Minuet Lane, just off of Old Pineville Road. Uh, it's currently zoned I-2, and the proposed zoning is for TODCC. You can see we just had a recently approved TODCC. I think over the last couple months, that one just on the north side of Roundtree was approved. Uh, we also have a pending petition just at the end of Roundtree uh, that was deferred this evening for a decision, but uh, certainly seeing some transition begin to occur in this area to more transit-oriented uh, and supportive uses. This would be a continuation of what we're, con uh, what we're seeing in this area. Uh, the Woodlawn Transit Station Area Plan does recommend office industrial warehouse uh, on the site, uh, but again, it, it, the location is within a half-mile walk of the Woodlawn Station. Uh, and so it is applicable for the TODCC district at this time. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this petition and we'll be happy to take any questions uh, following presentation by Ms. Grant and Mr. Sweeney. Thank Anyone you. Anyone has ever tried to park in Plaza Midwood, they know what this location is. It's a tow lot. Um, as, um, uh, we have two speakers for Bob Sweeney and Bridget Grant. Again, I assume Ms. Grant will handle um, the time, thank you. You have three minutes. Thank you again, Bridget Grant, Land Use Consultant with Moran Van Allen. Pleased to be here tonight with um, representing RJS with Bob Sweeney. They did a phenomenal job on the presentation and I think we're all familiar with this area and all the transition that's taking place off of Roundtree between 77 and Old Pineville Road. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Move to close. Second. Uh, we have a motion that's been properly made and seconded. We will move on with the roll call vote. I am a yes. Mr. Bakari? Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to the last petition of the evening. Um, rezoning uh, agenda item number 41, rezoning petition 2021-239 by Drakeford Communities, LLC. Location is approximately 9.34 acres located on the west side of East W.T. Harris Boulevard, the north side of District Drive, and east side of Shorthorn Street. In Council District 4, Ms. Johnson's district. The current zoning is 01 CD office conditional and the proposed zoning is R12 MFCD, multifamily residential conditional. Staff recommends approval of this petition upon resolution of outstanding issues related to transportation and site and building design. There is no opposition, uh, so uh, the petitioner will have three minutes after M Mr. Petten's presentation. Thank you. Our last petition of the evening, 2021-239, uh, is 9.3 acres on Shorthorn and District Drive, as well as East W.T. Harris Boulevard. Currently zoned to 01 conditional, and the proposed zoning is for R12MF, multifamily residential conditional. Uh, future land use from the Newell Small Area Plan does recommend office uses for the site. Uh, that was due to the rezoning that uh, converted that property to those office uses. Um, I can't remember the exact year that was, but uh, back maybe 2003. Uh, the 2021-239 proposal is for up to 98 alley-loaded single-family attached dwelling units at a density of about 10.5 units per acre. Uh, it does limit building heights to 40 feet for uh, specific buildings A, B, C, D, N, and O, and then 48 feet for all other buildings. Uh, do, does propose two access points on to Shorthorn Street uh, and an eight-foot sidewalk and eight-foot planting strip along both District Drive and Shorthorn. Uh, does propose a combination uh, of the following exterior building materials, brick, natural stone, stucco, cementious siding, uh, and then vinyl and other materials would uh, have to be approved by uh, the planning director. Usable porches when provided would be covered and be at least three feet deep. Does limit attached dwelling units to a maximum of six per building or fewer when they front a public street. 50-foot Class C buffer 
uh, along the north property line could be reduced by 25% with a fence, and then a 50-foot Class A buffer uh, along the pro property line parallel to Shorthorn Street, that could also be reduced 25% with a fence, and does identify a 100-foot post-construction buffer and an isolated wetland on the site, and also identifies possible tree save areas and water quality areas uh, located throughout the project. Staff does recommend approval of this petition. Do have some outstanding issues with transportation and site and building design to resolve. It's inconsistent with that office recommendation uh, back from 2005 on the site, uh, but staff does feel that the uh, mix of or the proposed residential uses uh, that they've got on the site do uh, provide some context and uh, compatibility with the existing single family uh, just off of Shorthorn, a little bit further north off Albrecht and Damascus Street. Uh, and we'll be happy to take questions following the petitioner's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Petten. Uh, we have four speakers um, in for the petitioner, Bobby Drakeford, Matt Langston, Anthony Fox, and Andrea Hankins. Um, I, I don't know um, if Mr. Fox or Mr. Drakeford will probably be taking this. Yes, this is Bobby Drakeford. Thank you. You have three minutes, Mr. Drakeford. Well, thank you so much, uh, Councilman Winston, for recognizing me, and thank you to the entire city council and, and staff for allowing us to speak. Uh, Matt Langston will come in or perhaps be available for questions, and Ms. Hankins is the president of the Back Creek Homeowners Association, and staff did an extra job explaining everything. If you could just uh, shift to slide number three and that'll really consume all of my comments. I just want to also uh, compliment uh, Council Member Johnson. As you'll know, uh, before we filed in September, we talked with her to understand the community and their perspective on some prior zoning efforts in this area. And she gave us a tremendous amount of direction and we started off speaking with CDOT and then we met with the neighborhood in October. Ms. Hankins was very involved throughout and that was before we filed a rezoning. We also went and spoke to uh, the North Carolina Department of Transportation about some community concerns. And then we had a broader meeting with other leaders of the HOA. So we had really good insight before we went to the community meeting in March, which was virtual and very well attended. I think about 50 folks attended. And then we had a follow-up call uh, last week. So that's much of what I wanted to share, really just to thank Councilmember Johnson and the community for expressing their concerns, giving us direction. We feel very good about this project. We think it will be an enhancement to the area, uh, offering a product type that isn't uh, often as available in this area and attached for sale product. But we think it will be complimentary and much uh, more improvement than the prior rezoning. Um, and I don't know if Ms. Hankins is on, if she'd like to speak some, I'll defer to her, otherwise I'm finished. Ms. Hankins, um, you do have some time left if you're on. Uh, how much time is left, Ms.? We have a minute and 12 seconds if you would like to use it, Ms. Hankins. Thank you so much. Um, good evening to Council. And much of what Mr. Drakeford has shared, I too would like to take a personal point of privilege to thank Councilwoman Johnson for listening and advocating for our community. I am Andrea Hankins. I'm the president of the Back Creek Farms Associ Homeowners Association. And while the community would love to not have the construction noise, a few less units, um, as well as to maintain the greenery that we presently have, we do understand the need for density. And as a whole, understand that Charlotte needs to continue to grow. We appreciate the developers reaching out to us to address our concerns, hear our concerns, and, and make an attempt to address some of those. We talked about uh, traffic signals, um, left, excuse me, left turn signals, uh, tr concerns about traffic, um, and it's been a positive experience. And so I will close with just continuing to ask the rezone committee and council to exercise due diligence in making sure that proposed requests add value to the surrounding community because this proposal um, is appearing to be a better fit for our community than a different one that I spoke against a year ago. Thank you so much. 
Uh, thank you uh, very much, Ms. Hankins. Um, and uh, Ms. Hankins did allude to uh, this was before council about a year ago. Um, I think it was pulled. Um, it was for some potential of affordable housing units, um, but there was concern from council members about the location, its proximity to East, Bo East WT Harris Boulevard, the um, inability for uh, uh, affordable uh, people that might need affordable housing and to 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 not have good public transportation or safety options uh, crossing WT Harris. Um, and there were significant um, uh, additional concerns um, uh, by the community that ultimately um, uh, pushed that uh, petition uh, 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 away, which is why we are, are here today. Um, with that said, I will recognize uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Winston, and thank you, Ms. Hankins, for speaking again, and um, it, it's great to see you. And I just, I just want to say um, that this is to be a guide or a standard of what development, what I hope the development looks like in District 4. This, this, these residents, they spoke out, they shared their concerns. And when we talk about strategic and responsible development, this is what we have to consider. So yes, there's a need for affordability and density, but all of these things, location and safety and traffic and all of that needs to be considered. So I am just honored to serve um, uh, District 4 and, and, to, and to serve this area and, and I'm happy I, and, and I, I, I just want you all to know that if there were opposition she would be <laughs> she would be here so the fact that she's here speaking in support of this development um, I, I want council to take note of that that this is the type of development and the type of process that we should be advocating for for our, for our residents so um, I'm looking forward to supporting it, um, and I and I and again I thank you, I thank you both for your support, uh, Mr. Drakeford, and um, Ms. Hankins. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yes, Ms. Har uh, Ms. Johnson is 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 correct. I had the opportunity to speak um, with the community um, around that pre that uh, petition last year, and they are quite organized, um, quite a diversity of voices. Um, um, but uh, but organize and they do speak with with one voice. Um, with that, do, do we have any more? Um, second, seeing and hearing no additional um, comments. That motion has been properly made and seconded. Uh, I'm a yes, Mr. Bakari. Yes, Mr. Driggs. Yes, um, Mr. Graham. Yes, Ms. Johnson. Yes, Mr. Eggleston is a yes too. Mr. Eggleston is back, and he is a yes. Um, Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Uh, Mr. Phipps? Yes. With that, we have no more petitions. Motion. Uh, point of privilege, Mayor Winston, you have done an incredible job tonight. Well, I, I thank you very uh, much, Mr. Picari, especially for your careful criticisms um, throughout it. Um, uh, I know it comes with the role, comes with the seat. Um, but thank you all for, 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 for tonight. I think it was a great meeting. I'll make a motion to close. Second. All in favor. Third. Aye. Uh, yes, aye. <laughs> thank you. Great haircut, Dave. <laughs> I thought we were going to get Thank you. We've been getting them all day in here, so I thought we were going to. <laughs> Thank you.